to call the study session of the Littleton City Council to order. Uh, all of council is present except for Mayor Pro Tem Wright, who's out of town, uh, caring for family. Um, so we've got four things on the agenda tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about the East Community Center, get an update from Littleton Public Schools about that, talk about stadium district funding, which are kind of connected, maybe connected, possibly connected, likely connected. Very connected. <laughs> <laughs> Um, then we have an urban forestry management plan, and then finally we'll be kind of talking about the uh, follow-up of SB 213 that we kind of discussed a, a few weeks ago, I think. So I'll turn it over to the city manager to get us into the East Community Center discussion. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the council. Uh, the East Community Center is a project um, initiated by and is certainly uh, led by the Little Public School District. <laughs> And uh, it's a project that would continue activity at the site where East Elementary School uh, was until it, it closed. Um, and there's been an extensive... It is, it is for a couple more days. Oh, it is. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Three more days. Three more days. Go. <laughs> it hasn't closed. I stand corrected. <laughs> um, there's been extensive community process. And I think, you know, our staff certainly has been involved and we can attest to the rigorous process that has, uh, has, has occurred on, on behalf of the uh, district, but really with the broader community, um, brainstorming and debating and thinking about how best the, a, a community center could be constituted to serve the district and also the, uh, and also the broader community. Um, so tonight we have an update. We think it's, it's time that the city council has an update on this important project, um, as there have been some preliminary direction points uh, determined, although there's still much work, work to be done. Uh, we're joined by Melissa Cooper, Assistant Superintendent with the district tonight. Um, she'll be able to directly give the presentation, but I'll first ask our Assistant City Manager, Kathleen Osher, to give a little more background on the city's perspective on the project and the ways that we've been engaged so far. Yes, so as City Manager Beck Lindbergh shared, we're joined this evening by the Assistant Superintendent of Littleton Public Schools, Melissa Cooper. Um, it's been wonderful partnership. The city has um, been part of the very robust conversation in the community about the future of East Community Center about a year ago, um, and then launching in the fall of 2022, a pretty broad community conversation. Um, I think some sort of state-of-the-art approaches and really fantastic facilitation to make sure that all community members could really be heard as part of that process. I mean, I think it was best practices at its very best in terms of watching that process unfold and, and how the community was engaged throughout. So as we've been watching that, um, we went through that process, had various members of our staff participate. You know, there were small group discussions. There was an opportunity to kind of vet and and um, think through ideas and have sort of a, an open house night of all of the ideas. So as, as the report came together, the next steps were pretty clear about launching and, and opening the East Community Center. So we've been really pleased to, to serve on that advisory committee. Um, so I've been working with Melissa and a team of five others. Seven. Seven, yes. seven total? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so we uh, have been going through a process to identify partners as well as think through some of the the requirements you know everything from sort of what a leasing agreement may look like and and think through some of those details so we're at a really good point this evening to come with you and share kind of an update of how that community conversation has influenced the next steps what those next steps are the timeline that we're looking at and then a really unique opportunity that the city might consider as part of funding that's become available from the stadium district funds so that will kind of dovetail into that so with that i'm happy to turn it over to you but it looks like powerpoint is relaunching okay <laughs> i can see i can, can see i can unfortunately change. see your yes. screen so yes. um do you want to keep dancing kathleen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're ready to roll <laughs> thanks magic booth upstairs <laughs> so with that i'll turn it over to melissa okay Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity to come and share um, both an update about the East Community Center as well as maybe a little bit more detail about an opportunity um, with regards to um, the Bronco Stadium funding. And um, 
I am so appreciative of, um, first of all, as I said, this opportunity, but also <coughs> the partnership that through this work we have been able to really enhance with um, the city. And um, I think that you'll be able to see as I share a little bit more detail just how that partnership is unfolding. Um, let's begin um, by sharing, um, I'd like to share the actual mission of the community center. And this was developed um, through the um, engagement process that we um, experienced in the fall. I believe that the last time that I was here with you all was like the night before we were beginning this um, community engagement process. And as a result of that process, uh, we were able to take the vision of the school board, and, um, which was to um, repurpose the building um, on the East Campus into um, a thriving center that would um, really accentuate the strengths of the community and serve the youth in our community as well as their families. And um, uh, as we were developing this um, mission with um, the community, it was really clear that um, this vision was going to um, really um, be able to um, capitalize on those strengths in the community. So I, I don't want to read it to you. You can see it there, but we really are um, dedicating this work to the strengths um, of the community in order to serve the needs um, that exist within the community. And um, as I said, really focusing on how we can serve um, the children and youth within um, the East um, community itself, but broader into North Littleton and all throughout um, the school district and surrounding areas, um, and really looking um, to develop and enrich um, that community. So as a result of the community engagement process, which was a series of four community meetings that um, we invited as many people as we could, it was a significant outreach, and we were so pleased um, to see how many people were really invested in um, sharing their voice and advocacy related to what would happen, um, not only to the building, but how we could use this concept of a community center to um, further um, the services for the youth and families in the community. And um, we, through that series of four meetings, um, we were able to collaboratively determine that we want the community center to focus on those nine areas that are listed up on uh, the screen. And I want to emphasize that these are in no particular priority order. Uh, the community was very engaged and um, very able to identify these areas of focus, but they um, really felt that it was important not to um, have one supersede another or take priority over another because we felt that there are strengths in the community that could be accentuated through these areas of focus. So they are sports and recreation, um, where we would leverage partnerships in our community to provide additional recreational opportunities um, for particularly our youth in the community. Um, child care. Um, we know that at um, the new elementary school being built on the Ralph Moody campus, um, otherwise known as Little Raven. They will have um, before and after school care, but um, we really, um, the community felt that having child care available at the East Community Center would also be important, not only for children who are um, not of school age, but also if we are going to be providing services in the community center for um, families, how important would it be for a parent to be able to come to the community center and bring their child with them and have access to child care well while that family member engaged in some other service while at the center another area of focus um, is wellness including both health and mental health um, being able to provide um, those services for youth and families um, within the community center 
Another area of focus is after school and youth groups, really being able to provide the youth in our community with opportunities that they may not ordinarily be able to engage in, um, either through different classes, tutoring, um, support opportunities, mentorships, um, that kind of thing um, through the community center. Educational classes, um, I've already mentioned um, tutoring opportunities for our youth, but also educational classes for families. Um, you know, different opportunities for adults to continue to um, engage in their learning. Small business support where we would be able to partner with different businesses in the community and um, provide um, everything from space um, for small businesses to use to um, different um, any other partnership opportunities that we might be able to identify. Community market as well as um, a food bank. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, community space and garden was another area of focus that had been identified, as well as providing the youth and families with um, resource navigation opportunities, knowing that um, families in the area might have a need to, um, to access different resources in the community, um, but might need support um, for us to come alongside and help them navigate the way. So those are the areas of focus that were identified. And I don't know your protocol, but feel free to, if it's okay, stop me as, as, well, they will. as we're going, if you have <laughs> questions. Okay. I, I have a couple questions. Yes. So the um, health and mental health um, resource, are you going to be partnering with local providers? That's the intention. Would they come on to site then? That is the intention. Yes. So I appreciate that question. Let me clarify. When, we, when I'm listing these areas of focus, this then drives what we are looking for in the partners um, from the community to then be able to um, negotiate an agreement with the school district for space in the community center to then be able to provide these types of services. So um, I'll get to this in a minute, but just to be a little bit more clear, we have put out a request for information to interested uh, parties in the community, and we've asked them if they might be interested in partnering with us. And we um, are really focusing in on two criteria. One is how can you support youth and their families in our community? And then two, what area of focus would you align with? So that's really how we're kind of narrowing in on those partnerships. I had a question, and I think that you talked about child care. Is that different than the after school? So this would be daily child care, and would there be any kind of discount offered to the families that would be different than going to maybe a private sector? Yes. Care? Yes, so we're still working out those details, but um, so the, the child care would be different than after school activities. So we will have, as I had mentioned, a, a school age child care program at Little Raven. So the students um, who are attending um, school who came from East and are now at Little Raven, they would have the opportunity for, um, for child care through the school. However, um, we would have after school opportunities for students. Uh, we would be working with our transportation department to transport the students back to the East Community Center and then engage in some of those after school activities. And everything that we are doing, we're really looking through that lens of serving um, um, a community that we want to be able to provide access to these resources. So we are really intending to reduce or eliminate barriers for access, um, including financial. So the child care is, that's still not clear, is that? Yes. Uh, for so people, for, uh, students, you know, yes. like a so it would be students, um, and again, we're not. We're still working this piece out. But if we were to create a child care center, it would be for students who are not yet school age, or what would likely be um, what we will likely have before we do that would be child care for um, parents and families who are coming to access other um, services at the community center. So, for example. Um, um, a parent might be coming, um, a Spanish-speaking parent might come to take an English class, 
And while they are in that English class, we would have childcare so that, again, reducing barriers so that they would be able to access that class and then their child would be able to receive care. Does that make sense? All right. Keep stopping me as we go, but I will keep going. Um, so once again, all of this work um, has really been based on um, partnership. Um, first and foremost, it's really important for me to again express my gratitude um, to the part to our partnership with the city, um, as well as um, to our partnership with um, the Littleton Public Schools Foundation. Beth Best is here this evening, um, indicating her support um, through um, really that that primary partnership. We've been able to. Um, um, have this community engagement process that resulted in those identified areas of focus and um, now we are able to really go back to those um, community organizations who have um, expressed interest and we're beginning the process of determining what that partnership actually could look like. So um, we had, when we did the community engagement um, process, we had over 200 individual participants um, over the series of four meetings, and about um, half of them were community partners. And um, specifically, there have been 45 organizations who, um, from our community here in Littleton, who have expressed interest in um, being a partner in um, the center itself. Our Board of Education um, is fully committed to this work. They have decided that they would like for the district to maintain leadership of this center, at least while we get it going. Um, however, they are fully understanding that in order to do this work and to do it well, we are going to have to look outside of the district's general fund in order to be able to fund um, the community center. The 45 community organizations, is that a combination of businesses, nonprofits? Yes, or yes, and yes. Is it a nice, diverse mix? It is okay. a very nice um, mix. Um, some of whom are currently already serving in Littleton. Others are coming from outside of the Littleton area, but expressing interest in Littleton. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's a nice mixture of, of all of the above. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so um, we are really um, in, believe it or not, the final planning stages, but it feels like we have so much work to still do. Um, we, our Board of Education um, did um, identify that we needed an advisory <laughs> committee in order to take that leadership that I just mentioned that they would like to, to maintain. And so that advisory committee advises both the Board of Education and our superintendent. It's a seven uh, member um, committee. Um, and what the primary work right now of that committee is to um, get more specific. Yes, we had 45 interested um, participants in the community engagement process, but we actually have been hearing from more throughout this entire process, the year-long planning. And so right now, um, the advisory committee has, as I mentioned earlier, sent out a request for information to all interested community partners, and we are vetting those um, requests that, that came in. And we're really looking at a phased approach to opening the community center. Um, I mentioned this to you all last time, and we are still on track to open in August. We will not open with a full community center. We will open with a first phase of partners um, that will um, be able to align with those areas of focus. And um, from there, we will continue to grow. Every community partner that will be a part of the center will have an agreement with the district where we will work out everything from what kind of space do they need to um, how are we going to work out the financial agreement. Um, and uh, we will just continue to grow from there um, while really working to um, serve our youth and, and hear feedback from our community as to um, how things are going. What do you the, anticipate the schedule to look like? Is this yeah. Primarily a, a summer program or, okay. 
No, that's a, that's a really great question. In our request for information, we asked our partners, when would you um, be most interested in operating? Um, because as we were thinking about the phased opening, we were thinking um, year round, but maybe we start with just a certain time of day. Um, so like maybe two to six or two to seven, you know, whatever the, the community was most interested in. <clears throat> Believe it or not, um, in the request for information, we have had the full gamut. We've had folks wanting to serve on Saturdays. We've had folks wanting to serve in the evenings. and everything in between. So um, that's a perfect segue into the management of the center. Um, the district will maintain all of um, the maintenance of the building. Security, technology, phones, um, all of the, um, the ongoing maintenance to run a building. Um, we were planning on that anyways if the school maintained operations as a school. So we will maintain those operational responsibilities. And then um, we are in need of more direct oversight and management to allow us to be more flexible with our hours um, and be responsive to um, the needs of, of our community. Um, and so that hopefully we can go a little bit beyond just that beginning phase of, of shorter hours. And so specifically, um, we will be needing um, um, staff to be able to staff the building um, so that we can um, offer those services when they are needed in our community. Does the district have a ballpark for what those operational costs are? Um, just assuming it's like basic supervisory, building mechanical, electrical, like utility service provision. So you, you did a perfect segue into ah, two slides one. from now, and here you go. So it's like um, I read you your slides. I must have skipped one. <laughs> so uh, before I go into that in detail, let me just mention um, what what um, we're we're thinking. We need overall is about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to get the program up and running, and then I'm going to give you that detail here in a minute. Um, but I want to really hit on why we're um, part of why we're doing the requests for information and really starting to establish those partnerships. Our ultimate goal is that. Um, after we open the center, the center will start eventually to pay for itself. As we work through the partnerships with the different um, different agencies and different partners, um, we would then be able to work out those individual agreements to be able to fund itself. That's going to take a while, um, but um, that's the overall intention. Not to make a profit, well, how but does that to work because they have to have operating budget and if you're trying to you know, have access and have discounted programs that isn't so essentially they would be paying um, some form of rent for their space in the building and then that rent would then be used for us to then be able to fund a staff member. We're not talking an extensive amount of ongoing budget, which um, Stephen I haven't forgotten your, your question I will get to here in a moment, but um, that's that, that's the intention there. Okay. All right. Sorry, I should have said council member R. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> that's very important to me, and I broke protocol. Council member Barr, here is the answer to your question. Um, so when we are thinking about building maintenance, um, we are estimating eighty thousand dollars a year. And this is based on our current operations. And we realized that that could actually be um, a little bit less depending on how much of the building we are actually using in year one. Um, but that would be um, for all of the operations and maintenance in all of the different trades, um, $80,000. Custodial and janitorial services. It's, of course, very important that as the community um, is accessing the space, that we are able to keep it keep it up and nice and um, operational. And that would be one hundred and five thousand dollars. That basically is to pay for the staff to um, provide those services. Utilities, one hundred and fifteen thousand, and then our staff, two hundred thousand. And then we've even included our thoughts around different um, marketing and, and whatnot that we would need. So that's an additional 40 with 20 for signage and then 24 marketing. 
So, um, in addition to that, we also feel like within our um, just the startup and that initial phase that we might need some additional funding for programming as well. Um, so, for example, to be able to um, provide some support where the district enters as a service provider, um, providing um, tutoring support or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and we estimated that at 200 dollars so that's the um, the ongoing cost that we're anticipating okay that concludes my update on East Community Center Is there any additional questions, questions? Cost questions. thank you very much yes I, and I'm pretty excited about this and I know many of the neighbors over there are too but there's yes. still lots of questions because you, you just don't know yet it's just right. it is. I, I'm just right. Uh, on your budget, on the numbers though, they, they to me look low. Mm -hmm. And so are you budgeting, like trying to budget right on, you trying to budget over? Uh, we are trying to budget, uh, now again, we, ha we are, have run schools, right? We haven't run a community center, but we are basing all of those on actual costs when we look at what it costs to run a school. So um, we feel like it's pretty accurate because, um, we, we looked at what does it take for maintenance in any of our schools, right? So then we got that number from that, um, as well as custodial and janitor and utilities. And the reason I, now that Tiffany's here, because Tiffany uh, does a great job at budgeting, and yeah. fortunately she's always over at budgeting, which is great. Mm -hmm. That's really not I'm over. Over. Uh, over conservative. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have a couple more questions. Of course. Of course. Is, is South Suburban involved with you as far as taking care of the grounds or anything like that? That, that is one of the concerns of the folks living on that. Um, so the grounds will be kept up by the um, Littleton Public Schools. Are there going to be any fields that they're you, you hope to use, turn them into? Or? Yes. Um, as part of our focus for um, sports and recreation, we are looking to um, identify partners that could um, utilize the fields. We're also hoping to maintain the playground for <coughs> community use. That's my next question. Uh -huh. And then my last two questions, what are... Well, one security. I presume you're going to have security there. Yes, we will. Things. Yes, we will. And that's part of the costs and that we have here. The last and obviously the most important, you're, you're renaming all the schools. Are you going to rename East Community Center? I appreciate that question. Um, right now, we are operating it as if it is the East Community Center. Um, we have no intention as a district of renaming it um, because it's a beloved um, part of the community. However, um, as we begin to live into the community center, um, we will likely engage in a similar community engagement process where we would um, collaboratively as a community rename the center. Cool. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. I have another Thank question. You. Is this, uh, it's, it's focused on the neighborhood, I understand that, but can people outside the neighborhood Yes. Opt in and come to the programs. And Absolutely. It. So it's not restrictive to a certain geographic point. It is not. It is not. Obviously, our focus is East and North Littleton, uh -huh. but we will um, be welcoming any anyone in any surrounding community. Have we embarked on discussions about library extension? I know that came up in the initial conversations and planning process, but I don't know if that had evolved into anything more. Um, we. We have had that conversation, mm -hmm. and um, what we are experiencing right now is we put out, um, we, we had outreach for partners, and then we're going through the partners that, that reached out and responded to our outreach, and we're identifying of those nine focus areas of the mm -hmm. conversations of, of interest that we've had, where might there be some holes, and so then um, the district will go through the process then of, of reaching out. So um, we're in the process of having that conversation. I have a silly question. Or, I, th I think this is so it's fantastic, and I can't wait for it to open in August. Yeah. Are other, so other school districts in the state of Colorado done something similar, or are you blazing the trail? So we are pretty much blazing the trail. Um, there is a similar concept in um, DPS, but it doesn't have the same community feel the same community engagement process um, so on and so forth and um, we do believe that um, 
other um, coming communities might be watching because as you've probably seen um, some districts are experiencing declining enrollment many are and um, schools are closing and um, this could be um, an incredible way to give back to the you community. better keep good records because they're all coming to right. you right that's good right questions that's right I do have another job, you know. That's <laughs> right. yeah, this is just this is just other duties as assigned for yeah. you, right? Yeah. Um, but we did design uh, sort of design this evening's presentation to have this East Community update, and then sort of dovetail into a conversation about our stadium district funds that are available and, and as council starts to think through those. So I know beyond um, the 750,000 that has been identified would be helpful. There's some additional needs too. And, and then we'll kind of uh, go through a presentation specifically on stadium district funds, but we wanted to take advantage of just a few more minutes of Melissa's time before she has to go back to the okay. school board meeting. Yes. yes, we're having a school board meeting on a Tuesday night. This is thrilling my whole meeting on a Tuesday night? <laughs> I know, I know. So um, thank you for the opportunity to share just a few other um, considerations for needs um, with regard to the, the, the stadium funding. Um, when we really went through um, uh, our, our considerations of the needs that we have within Littleton Public Schools beyond the $750,000 um, need for the East Community Center, um, we have identified that summer school um, will continue to be an ongoing need. Um, we have been able to provide summer school for the past two years in a more expanded way because we have had ESSER funds um, through COVID relief. <coughs> And um, that has become our, our primary source of funding for um, summer school. And so um, in order to be able to continue to provide summer school um, in the future, as well as, and probably more importantly, to leverage um, the Epic Campus, for which will be opening in August as well, um, in order to leverage that campus to provide camps for um, some of our youth within uh, the summer, um, you know, d within the different pathways, providing, um, you know, um, uh, an aerospace um, camp or, you know, something related to teacher cadet or whatever the case may be, um, we um, are finding that we need some funding to be able to um, maximize our ability to be able to provide some of those summer opportunities for our students. Um, with regard to our early childhood, you um, probably are aware that we are consolidating our um, village early childhood sites onto one campus, which is at the um, former Highland Elementary School. So it will become the village for early childhood, but it will be housed out of um, um, the Highland Elementary School and that two is opening in August. We have uh, busy times ahead in August, um, but we really um, have been um, leveraging different grants to be able to provide a state-of-the-art um, early childhood center for our youngest learners. And um, we have um, incredible outdoor space, indoor recreational space, um, and we were hoping um, to be able to finish out that um, the development of our new center with an outdoor classroom um, for our youngest learners um, and would appreciate the consideration for some additional funding for that. And then historically um, in our district, the, um, the STEM programming, so the science and technology, um, engineering and math programming for our students in the middle level has required equipment um, to be able to uh, provide access to that kind of programming for our middle schoolers. We have been so grateful to the LPS Foundation for their support with that programming. And um, we have identified that we do um, need a little bit more um, funding for that to be able to replenish some of the equipment for our students. So those are just some additional considerations for funding. What is LPS going to do with the old village school? Yeah, great question. Um, that is becoming um, the campus where we will have some, uh, it's totally going to the opposite end of um, of age. And we will be um, having our next program, which is our GED program, um, driver's ed, um, 
interim educational services for students between placements. Um, it will continue to have our Voyager program. So more for um, our secondary age students. Got two kind of pointed and direct questions that aren't necessarily indicative of my stance on this, but okay. I just wanted to forewarn you. Thank you. <laughs> What's your ask to the city of Centennial regarding uh, city district funds and the East Oak Community Center? So we have um, we have engaged in partnership um, with them. We um, have not had the opportunity to, if you're asking specific to state for stadium or, or for funding the community center since, you know, East, the, the catchment used to go over into Centennial. Correct, you know, correct. Um, OBS goes into Centennial. We have not had the opportunity to um, ask them for funds, um, certainly through the stadium um, district funds. Um, that opportunity has not presented itself to us. And um, we have not <coughs> formally made a request for funding um, to the city of Littleton at this time. We have partnered with them throughout the community engagement process, though. And then? Formally engaged with Centennial? Centennial. I thought I heard Littleton. Mm -hmm. Centennial. Mm -hmm. And what is the, what's, what's the plan? And let's go opposite of what you're thinking, let's say city council says, thanks, but we have other ideas what to do with this money. How does that affect the community center? And what's, what's, what is LPS's plan B or C or D or E or whatever? Yeah, good question, good question. Um, the, we are fully committed to seeing this project through. Um, we're grateful for the opportunity for the stadium uh, funding. However, if that doesn't work out, um, we would have to seek other um, sources um, through different grants. Um, we could possibly look at um, our Medicaid reimbursement funding. Um, uh, we will not be utilizing the general fund. Our Board of Education has made that very clear. So um, to be very honest with you, we would continue to try to piece this together. Haven't we committed to them? We no, we haven't committed nope. anything. No. That's why that's why we're having this, these discussions tonight. So you this is your ask for the money. This is she is this is just what their plans are. We'll have this discussion next during our next agenda item, item tonight. <laughs> so uh, city manager to a little bit of the same point. Um, I had heard a couple questions and we had a conversation with the district about the question, you know. There might be a thought that the district has other monies from the state or monies that can be used that you use to, to operate schools for this this community center. Could you speak to how this is different and how you really I know you you explained to us that you really are limited. You can't use monies that are that are otherwise used for um, funding school operations that might be your general fund for this so I, th I think it's it might be important just to explain the limitation on that sure thank you for that question so the when i mentioned that we're not going to use the general fund we get um, funding from the state on a per pupil amount and so our board of education does not feel that it would be appropriate to redirect funding that is intended for students and their education and so redirect that funding into the community center. Knowing that they fully support this vision, this is their vision, they want to be able to serve um, the youth and their families in our community, yet they know that there are limitations to what um, that funding <coughs> should be used for. And so they would then um, expect me, if we aren't able to, um, utilize this funding, then they would expect me to find other sources of funding um, outside of what we would use for students. Does that answer your question? We all know the school districts are flush with cash and can spend of uncertain course. money. <laughs> That's why the don't, don't have any, <laughs> just like businesses. Constraints. Um, I know the uh, consolidation of the schools um, is, is partially uh, brought about with some financial efficiencies. How much uh, with the closing of Ames facility and, and repurposing um, some of the other schools, how much of that financial offset would, could be put towards this? Because I know you had maintenance costs and other programming costs that say at Ames. Um, clearly this is a little bit different, a little more complex, but what's the overall 
budget layout for those types of... So we really um, haven't been able to actualize true savings with um, the consolidations of our schools, primarily because of declining enrollment. And so as the number of students that we have in our district uh, is going down, the funding too is going down. So we started that, um, that consolidation with the intention of um, being much more financially efficient. And we are. It is so much more efficient to have a three-round school, three-round being where you have three classes at every grade level, as opposed to one and then two and then four, right, in some of our smaller schools. Um, so we are more efficient with our funding, but we, um, because of declining enrollment, we wouldn't be able to um, repurpose any of that additional funding that might have been made available um, because it simply isn't uh, because of declining enrollment. Any other questions for Melissa here? Do you have a timeline for, I know this advisory board that's coming together, um, is there intent to select um, staff or an executive director to kind of uh, lead this advisory board kind of into the future, or is that two or three steps ahead of us? Um, to be very frank, um, that will happen when we have the funding to be able to hire that individual. So um, it could happen <clears throat> as soon as that person very is soon. on board. Yep. Yep. I have one final question. You you mentioned, but I just want to hit on it again. So this initial funding to get off the ground, there were there were lots of ongoing operational costs, including that. Yes. Um, the goal is to have that taken care of Absolutely. with everyone there, because as far as I know, the city doesn't have seven hundred fifty thousand no. dollars to annually uh, provide Correct. to LDS. So any consideration within the stadium funds would not be intended as ongoing, knowing especially that it's not ongoing funding. Um, but um, we are being very thoughtful in how we are approaching the different partnerships. Um, also realizing that we may not have one model for all of the partnerships. Some partnerships may not be able to um, provide as much um, in rent as perhaps another, right? And so we're really being thoughtful and creative with how we would set up those partnerships with the full intention that this become um, self-sustaining moving forward. And looking into the probably distant future, I know with the, the cyclical nature of student enrollment, and as I mentioned the Ames facility and Dr. Justina Ford School, what's, what's the plan with East Community Center, say in 20 years, there's a lot more young kids here. Is there is there a chance that it goes away and goes back to a school? How, what, is there a long-term <coughs> vision of that, or will it in perpetuity be a community center? I know the school district never likes to give up Correct. property. Or Correct. Um, so actually, that discussion is happening right about now in our school board meeting, where we are hearing the plans for um, receiving the um, demographic report um, about the future projections of enrollment and any boundary considerations that we might need to be making with regard to Dr. Justina Ford and other elementary schools and middle schools. Um, I will tell you that the preliminary five-ish year um, projections are not looking good. And by that, I mean we are not expecting an increase in our enrollment. It, in fact, we're expecting to continue to decline. Um, it's hard to project much further out than that. Um, I cannot predict if we have um, a significant increase in, in enrollment, could the school board at that time, 20 years from now, repurpose the East Community Center into a school. It's possible, but we also have other um, um, sites. Like we are maintaining Peab Peabody Elementary. We are maintaining Twain Elementary. So um, I, it's hard to predict, but um, I can tell you that the current board is fully committed to the long haul for the East Community. You're not going to commit to any future board's decisions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I do know enough not to do that. <laughs> for, the, for the record, I live in the in the east boundary there, so my kids go to Ralph Moody's or Little Raven. Next Little Raven. Yep. It's not Moody anymore. 
I'm going to go to Moody at Twain. <laughs> Great. Anything else? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. I'm going to your next it. board meeting. Yeah, yes. I intend to. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. So it moves us right into our discussion on uh, the stadium district funds that we will put that. Is Kathleen going to leave this or leave this? Or is Tiffany. Tiffany I'm just going to advance about the, about the, about the, you know, the $1.2 million that we got from the sale of the Broncos that we can use towards youth. Uh, activity programs and uh, you know we have the discretion to s allocate those funds however we want um, this is just one of the options that we have presented towards us so it's not however we want I mean, there are well youth activity programs youth activities. However, yeah yeah and I would only add mayor thanks a nice uh, summary just that um, the council's not obligated to allocate these funds tonight or in the near future uh, we have a few ideas for you tonight to share and things that would uh, you know, advance some programs that uh, we've been all, you know, I've, I've heard some ideas from council, some ideas from staff, some ideas from community partners like you just heard. Um, but, you know, I think just to, just to, to let, just to, to underscore, um, if you don't, that's okay. We can keep thinking about it and bring these ideas back as part of our, our budget process or as, as we have more candidate programs that would work for this funding. Uh, we recommend, of course, that these are uh, one-time or very limited duration programs that you'll be, be seeing that you use this money for because it's not ongoing. It's $1.2 million uh, to use one time. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll turn. There's, there's no restriction like with ARPA, ARPA funds that they have to be spent by a certain date, is there? Right. There's not a, there's not a, a deadline there, um, but we are aware that the uh, Metropolitan Football Stadium District, who kind of is at the, is at the heart of this, the whole stadium, uh, will be following up. And there's, there is a, an expectation that we'll be able to demonstrate how we're using these funds, at least most of them, you know. Uh, this this coming year. Did you have anything else to add to that on the legal side of when we have to spend them? Or no? There's nothing in the agreement that calls for an expenditure. So to Jim's point, they will be following up. And I know some members of the media are interested as to whether this is benefiting new activity programs or just offsetting general revenue that would have already been spent. And it wasn't explicit in that. It's like, I mean, what was that it should... What you say again? One more time. Um, I know that there are certain media groups that are interested to see if this is just if this is going to generate new youth activities. You said media. Media, correct. News, media. News station. News news station. News station. Yeah. News station. Yeah. Paper. So the intent is not to supplant current operations or budget. You know, take the money from something and put this money in its place. Just, so just take this one point two and give it to the library and say now we can take now that we can library take money the, and do it. Somewhere that's else. not the plan. That's so not the intent. All of the ideas you'll see tonight would be new activities, new levels of service um, in the areas where we're where we're we're talking about. So, um, so we have just covered Tiffany's. So, so we we cannot use it to augment existing programs. You can use them to augment, <laughs> but not replace money. If we're if we're spending to the mayor's example, if we're spending a million dollars on the library because kids use the library currently with the general fund. We're not to use this money, a million dollars of stadium funding for one year. to plug that yeah. and then take the million dollars from the general fund and do something else. <coughs> Instead, no you might switch. take the million and add it to the million that we're, that we're already spending gotcha. for a new service level. And they don't want cities hanging on to it and like investing in it, you know, and right. letting grow money and not doing anything with it. But there's no, it doesn't sound like there's any kind of. But it's their, not their money. Yeah. But right. if you're not it's spending it. it, there's no <laughs> like, oh, you have to spend it by this certain time. It's our I don't money. know. It's our money. Is that correct, Reed? Is That's correct. And I would say that was the intent, although going through the lease agreement between the stadium district and the Bolin family, it's not actually specific that it can't be used to offset in terms of this, but I think the intent was that this was going to generate new youth programming um, 
as it was distributed to the municipalities, although it's not specific. But we're not restricted to that. No, we're not restricted, but I think that's the other intent. I think that's what he was saying with the media look, and it's, you know, it looks bad for a city. Well, the media looks bad that. anyway, so I don't care what they think. I really don't. Fair enough. Yeah. It's, it's what we got to be. Well, let's, I want to see what we're going to do. <laughs> Well, we've pretty much already talked about everything that's in the presentation this evening. Um, uh, the Bronco Stadium sold. We get a share of that. Any districts you were involved in the collection of taxes related to the national Bronco football team, not the stadium. Football no. team, correct. Um, uh, so any district that was involved in collecting sales tax to help fund that initially what got a share of some of the proceeds from the sale. And as we've been talking about, you know, the, really the only specific item is that it's youth activity programs, and that's really what they want to see this, uh, these funds go to. Our share is about $1.2 million. Um, we did uh, reach out to uh, the City of Littleton team, the leadership team, and just asked, you know, what kind of things can you think of that we could use these funds for to help promote youth activities? Um, and we came up with a few. Um, and so some of the internal requests were a couple of items, youth internships and first job programs. And I'll talk about first job programs, um, and then I'll let Kathleen kind of speak to the youth internships. Um, many, many years ago, we had a program here in Littleton uh, for, we called it First Jobbers, or First Job Program. And it allowed uh, youth to, who are ages between 14 and 16 to have a job with Littleton. Uh, we were able to um, give them some work experience, help them learn about uh, how, how does government work. Um, and it was a really good opportunity for um, individuals to really see what does the city do and you know tour some of the buildings and get some of that um, government experience. Um, it helped them for the future. We helped them uh, build a resume. Um, so I think there's a lot of value in a program like that. So one of the items that we listed was that program um, for the next three years, and it's about 50000 a year, so a total of about $150,000. Um, like I said, we've done this in the past. Um, you know, they can do some grounds work around the community. Um, we can have them help us in different departments within the um, city departments, helping <coughs> in different areas, um, HR, finance. There's certainly areas that we could provide them some, some work and guidance. Um, so it does um, help the youth in the community, and um, we feel like it aligns with the, the potential use of the stadium district funds. And then the youth internships program, um, what we're seeing is a lot of interest in both our small business and some of our larger industry sectors that overlap with the new EPIC uh, pathways. And so there's an opportunity, I think, working with our Littleton Business Chamber to provide some of those internships. That could be, for example, um, on the construction trade side, could be an opportunity to start to grow our own program of building inspectors, for example. It could also be providing some cities have been successful uh, kind of across Colorado of kind of creating a funding stream to allow for those first internships for small business that have a hard time funding those programs. So the city could offer that as grant funding or work in partnership with the chamber to, to sort of offset that cost. I think there are also um, just a, a, a whole field of opportunities with with epic and and for how they're placing students into those job opportunities either those that might be college bound or those that might be industry bound um, so i think we would want to look and and explore as much overlap as we could because we're seeing that all of those pathways are supporting a lot of the businesses that are going to be really called out in our overall economic development strategy. So I, this would be something that our economic development team and, and most likely our community development team would be able to take advantage of. And these are paid internships? Yes. And with internal requests, the library museum had no requests for youth programming? Well, we had some discussions, but they there there they weren't anything that we were ready to bring forward, and I uh, felt like there needed to be more discussion. And and frankly, one point two million didn't really tackle some of the the ideas that we had talked about for the library the space related facilities. Right. Related. right, I was just thinking to expand some of the pro. You know, you know, they used to do the, the summer camps and things like that. I mean, that was the, so yeah, um, they just weren't brought forward. Um, and so really those were the, the few internal requests that we did discuss and, and bring to you this evening. And uh, we 
we tag teamed or uh, coordinated this with uh, LPS so that we could talk about the East Community Center and some of their requests. So they did talk about um, the East Community Center and that startup costs of about $750,000 and then the additional programs um, that they talked about uh, kind of towards the end <laughs> on some of the early childhood and, and the middle school STEM programs that they were requesting to utilize some of the stadium district funds for. Um, I think one thing too that uh, is maybe a little different in, in, in our city is that, you know, we don't have a, a true parks and recs uh, department um, that might be providing some of these youth programs using these funds. And so we did reach out to South Suburban, but they didn't have any immediate needs or anything that they felt would align with the uh, prescribed use of the stadium district funds. So I just wanted to note that as well. Did, did you reach out to any of the youth sport organizations or like Town Hall Art Center or things? That no, no, we didn't. Um, you know, I think some other cities have utilized some community engagement on what they potentially might use the stadium district funds. And we have we have not done that. We haven't gone down that path or um, considered that. Um, we kind of wanted to see what your thoughts and if you had any additional ideas that you were thinking that we could use for the, the funds. As we've said, we can do more. We can have more rounds of discussion about this. Right. This is just kind of starting that discussion. Session round, discussion. Session round one. <laughs> starting the discussion, and you know, like we said, we don't. There's not a time frame to use these funds. We are holding these funds currently. We will maintain them separately, um, ensure that we're tracking them accordingly. Uh, like Reed mentioned, the uh, news outlets are interested in what we're using the funds for, and the district is also going to be following up probably later this year. Just for an update, um, you know, I, I I do know they don't want it to to go year after year after year without using the funds, right? Um, so we do have some responsibility to ensure that we're using them probably sooner rather than later. But we want to make sure it's for the right project and the right programs. And probably the only time sensitive mm -hmm. request we have is the East Community Center request. So I just also wanted to mention, um, so all of the programs that we've listed here, the total is about 1.325 million, so slightly over the 1.2 that we have currently. So I think that should also be a consideration. And that's the two internal and the Correct. six, X, five external. Five. That's my brother. So, okay. so uh, regarding the internship program, are we still doing internship program? We aren't. Why not? So, and we did it for many years though, right? Because I, I remember, I think Keith put the people to work one year, counting manhole covers. And that was, well, it sounds silly. It was turned out to be a valuable thing. Yeah. So when we did run the program, what, what was about the cost of those things? Um, so when I, when I looked back, it was probably about thirty-five to 40000 back then. So we would have to hire a coordinator um, to kind of manage. Three to four million now. What's that? <laughs> yeah, it was like three to four million. million. Three to four million today. <laughs> yeah, in today's dollars. Um, so we had to hire a coordinator. Initially, it was um, internal staff who was managing that program, but it, it expanded and, and workload and capacity issues. So we ended up hiring a coordinator for about three months during the summer, and then we would pay these um, youth, you know, between ages 14 and 16 um, to help us with community projects that we had, um, planting flowers. Um, it was a lot of grounds maintenance work. Um, and then, you know, of course it would rain and so we'd have to, to pivot and, and give them some other things to do in, inside. We didn't want them out there in the, the rain, but I think it was a really good program. Came in um, and did the audit for them. <laughs> <laughs> can we train all 16 yeah, year olds to get their CD license, CDL license too? I'm sure right. I don't think they would qualify for that yet, but uh, they could learn. Um, so if you had a ballpark, what would it be today? If, if you're so, so I was estimating about 50000 a year. Um, so that's where I came up with the $150,000 for a three-year program okay. right. in order to do that, yeah. Now, and, and, uh, w one last thing, too. So when we do budgets, the city budget, you know, we do the partnership thing. Some of that money goes toward that we distribute the taxpayers' money, goes toward youth-type stuff. So that's that's something, another option that it could be used for. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them. But you have our grants? Yes. Programs? Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, Yes, that's it, yeah. Some of it could be grant, but I'm thinking of, you know, at the end of the year with, with, with our budget where we do uh, 
organizations uh, request funds. Like the those. local partnerships. Yeah. Local partnerships. Yeah. Yeah. Local yeah. Partnerships. Some of it could go towards something like that. I'm sure some of them do have youth programs that they use those funds for. Yeah. Well, we if we did all of these programs, including the 750, we'd almost have enough. So it's, it's not like there's a big shortfall for these plans. And the thing about the uh, community centers, there's an infrastructure built. I mean, it's all... They, they have a plan for a manager, they've done the community engagement. It seems to me a good idea to give some portion, whether it's the whole 750, to them because that is already up and running in the plan. And not that these ought, can't be done, but uh, this would require more of a heavy lift. Just a thought. When does LPS need to know if? So the, the, the big ticket item obviously on that list is East. And if we, you know, we're obviously sitting here deliberating tonight, but we're not going to take formal action. So when would they actually need to know that the check is in the mail? Well, we have a, we have a limitation here too. These funds have not been appropriated, so we would have to appropriate them. So we'd have to have okay. an amendment to our amendment 2023 to budget. budget. So that's going to take two readings. And so we talked about potentially in June, um, maybe July. To, that to Councilmember Barr's point, you heard Melissa mention, they, if they're going to move forward with, with August, they need to get moving and they need to know that they have the funding right. um, to start hiring and putting things in, putting things in place. So we would notify them of your decision one way or, or the other um, so that they could start to make plans, if, even though it, it, it would take a month or so to Finalized. So that urgency, that request for information, reaching out to the sort of universe of potential partners, that's complete now. So there is a process that they're vetting. I think they'll identify those partners and probably sort of that first phase right around June 5th. Um, so that is the optimal time that for that funding to at least be pledged so that they can uh, look at the staffing component, because I think that's the next big hurdle is being able to identify the, the manager or director for the East Community Center. So I think, you know, June is is probably pretty important timing to know, you know, which pathways they still kind of have available. Yeah, that's kind of what I wanted at, to get at, at that time, will they know if they have any shortfalls in funding from other sources? So there, I think the, the funding piece is, is ongoing. So this 750 is really meant for that startup piece. So it is um, really critical to the August opening. And then where the RFI, that request for information from those community partners, identifies what resources would be needed for them to be part of that first phase. And then it'll translate into an actual leasing agreement, like Melissa talked about. So that would identify what, what rent was possible for them or if there were additional needs. So there are, they do have some uh, foundation support. So they'll be looking at that for that programming piece, but that's why they have that 210,000 identified as part of that programming piece in, in the first year. And if you remember kind of her operating costs slide. They, they, the East given us a budget. Yeah, so the, the budget that she walked through was, was the... It wasn't a budget, that was just the oversight. That's the start of... Have we seen yeah, the budget, though? Well, I don't think they know what the budget is because they, they don't know. We haven't seen a budget. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so they what they have identified and is part of the district's budget are the operating costs, right? So keeping the building intact and running, and then the next component of the budget will be based on the actual... Um, requests that they receive from partners and so that'll identify you know where uh, their financial participation can be the types of programs and then if that first phase is sort of um, bookended by certain times of the day I think the advisory committee our conversations we've thought you know sort of that after school two to six two to seven time frame felt like a more comfortable phase first phase but uh, that'll really be more driven by the types of partners that think they want to be part of that first phase. So I think we're getting a much broader um, set of operating and, hours potentially. And I wanted to expect to see a detailed budget come before us because they don't have that. They don't know. I think this they is, shouldn't expect seven hundred thousand dollars if they can't give us some kind of a budget. Well, I think this is. I mean, it's kind of building the plane and flying at the same time here. That they if they don't have this. I mean, if they don't have this funding. 
their budget is dramatically different than they don't, they don't have a coordinator. Um, they don't know all the other partners. Well, I understand the, the hurdles and things, but if an organization comes to us and say, hey, can you give us $700,000? We're going to put together this program, but we don't have a budget. It, it, it would, we, would, we would want a budget. And I think that's what you, I, I realize that they have some of the costs, so hard costs. Yeah. They can figure that out. Yeah. They still got to have a budget of some sort. Well, and I, I think that that's a request that we could make if, if council wanted to per, pursue, you know, kind of the next steps. Um, we could go yeah. back to the district and see what, how that budget is coming together. Uh, the costs that she outlined, that Melissa outlined in that slide, are ones that the, the district is incurring as part of their current, or I guess their next school year budget, if you will. So they're kind of basing it on if it was still open, like if the school was still open and yeah. operational. So this is what your operating costs. Right. Cost. So, yeah. so what, what that, that structure costs to, to operate and maintain. And they are, you know, sort of taking advantage of other staff that they have, but there are some specific costs to, kind of to like maintaining DDA. and operating that particular facility. Yeah, staff is a those tricky one. It's kind of like the DDA in the sense that, like, we have the broad strokes and then we use the ARPA money to seed it and then they hire the executive director get the advisory board get certified as the nonprofit and then you see like the programmatic budget that follows and kind of like the but on the other hand the DDA was also really like well fleshed out it was definitely more fleshed out right. than I, don't know, this. I think the budget that the DDA gave us was very similar to the budget that they should just be it, it was I think programmatically it was probably the DDA had more time had, you knew where the funding was going to be coming from for the for the foreseeable future for, for the next 30 years. We don't have this, that budget because they don't know what that is still. So. Well, we, we're working with Arapahoe <laughs> County right now. You know, it just is, yeah. But, you know, with this, you give them $750,000 and, you know, who knows if this even survives, you know, if they can't get people risk. to pay rent, if they can't, I don't, I didn't quite understand the rent piece of it. Why mm -hmm. would somebody pay rent to come in to... So let's just say, I'm just going to throw Town Hall Arts yeah. under the bus here and say, hey, they want to do some programming, rent out the theater and do a, 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 a school. Or a, a oh, school to rent page. out space at the school. Yeah. But they're, they're providing the, the facility for, gotcha. the community, right. for community. But not for the community. To, okay. To work so make, okay. and provide okay. services. So right. like a non they, they've kind of courted a bunch of nonprofits who have yeah. overhead and operational expenses like, for their right. kind of. So $750,000 yeah. is probably an approximation of what they think it'll take to operate right. the center. Their plan is that in future years, those rents will cover the operating costs for the building that the city would be paying in the first year. I want, I would underscore your point, uh, Councilmember Driscoll, we don't know that this is going to all work. So right. there is some some level of that uh, that that chance here. I think we we want it to work, um, but I don't want to guarantee or you know that we'll make this contribution and we know that it's going to go. I mean, it might take a little longer for them to actually get up and running, have the have the leases and the rents in place. I've I've suggested to them that based on our own budgeting process and priorities that we're seeing, I don't expect that at least staff will be recommending that as a priority. Council could choose to uh, to fund some of the ongoing costs if, if, if you choose to, but I've we've tried to clarify with them that their that their request is one time and it's coming from the stadium funds, which are not the city's general fund. Um, and it would be difficult for the city to have it have an ongoing right. operational right. role. So that's that's been the message. Uh, we don't know. There is some uncertainty as to whether it will all work out for 2025 and 2026. I think it would be a good idea maybe to get some word out there. I, I don't think a lot of people realize we have these funds uh, from the stadium. And I'm sure there's some other ideas out there. I know you kind of vetted some of this stuff, but I'm sure the community has some ideas of what we could potentially do it might be something good to get together with the South Platte uh, independent and have them put it out there and say hey what are your thoughts on what, what can we do with these funds I don't know I think you know I'm going to be in support of it because I look at it as this was not free money but essentially kind of free money um, to use to help jumpstart this community center it's it's something first on the map apparently like other school districts could be looking to LPS as this is a model, you know, a model um, 
repurposing of a school that you know had to shut down because of declining enrollment. And so instead of you know leaving this this community of North Littleton uh, with an empty building, and God knows you know what could happen in the future. I could sell it. You could. They and could, they but, but pull it. You should, <laughs> if you, I don't know if you went to any of the meetings. I went to the first one. I tried to go to all of them, but I could only get to the first one. It was packed. And the passion of the people that were at that meeting that wanted to see some kind of a community engagement, some kind of a place where those kids and those families could, you know, still come together because, you know, they, they, that was, I, you know, it was a big shock when they shut East down. So but maybe maybe North Littleton or uh, North Littleton Promise has some idea what to do with this money. But that's a that's, that's, what that's I was thinking. you know so so giving somebody seven hundred fifty thousand because they were the first ones to present. I think we need to have a little bit more outreach to the community. I just I think it's such a great pilot. I don't know if it's a pilot I, I, I programmer, agree. but I'm not, I'm not and it, it, there is some risk. Yeah. There's some, there's risk in everything, right? But it just seems like there's enough people and enough focus and enough energy and enough drive and enough passion to make this work. I, I don't foresee it failing. I, I just don't. It seems to me that community engagement was pretty thorough for this community center. Was there any discussion about a phased in approach? We talk about the risk and giving all 750 at once. Is it like an all or nothing thing? They are doing a phased in approach. I mean, she I said that city just they, funds. From, can we give them Two fifty the first. Yeah, some portion, and so you know, with the intent, if we wanted to, I don't know, um, of giving them more, but not just giving them all seven hundred fifty thousand upfront. Make it like a milestone. Base this is kind yeah. of this is the startup fund. Yeah, I don't so think they'd have to find money. So they need it all. That's what you're saying. Yes. Okay. And I, I think, think you would jeopardize their start plan. It would make it a if, riskier venture to if they had to go it. find money somewhere else. I mean, it seems to me that the community engagement and what they did and how they focused on the areas was pretty good. It's just a matter of we think there's other competing priorities. According to my calculations, if I did it right, there's a ninety thousand dollar delta between um, with the, all the programs that and what we got as our share, and to me that's doable. I mean, we could still do some portion of these other programs or or, or do a two-year internship instead of a three-year internship and then evaluate at that point in time. So it, it seems to me that we could still do the 750 and then <coughs> add some lesser amount to some of these other programs or do five and, and, and we don't have to make all these decisions tonight. Right. Well, the only thing is that these, I think we don't want to put it off indefinitely or too long because of the East Center is looking to open. Now, if we don't want to do it and we want to say, okay, you have to open in December, but why not make the decision now? I'm saying overall, I'm not saying you know, there's more immediacy for that particular. Yeah, so, so if we, if they are going to open in August, I think there is some immediacy that we shouldn't take too much time. I mean, whatever reasonable time is, makes sense. I know we're not taking formal action tonight, but to put this up for another six months seems inappropriate to me. So I will say that, you know, it would be my opinion that council would have to be pretty thoughtful in terms of how those monies were used. I mean, if we're talking about kind of repurposing that school and doing kind of the infrastructure, I think it's kind of outside the spirit of, of the agreement that it's not going to programming. It's really going to kind of, kind of update a structure. And while it makes sense intuitively that, look, you know, if you want us to have a, you know, a baseball program, we need a baseball field. So why not just spend it on a baseball field? Um, maybe to offset the cost of, you know, kind of the employees and some of the programming going on is probably something I would feel more comfortable from yeah. a legal standpoint. I think I think you're hitting it right on the head. You know, I look at my tax bill and 62 uh, mil, uh, 62 mills go to the Littleton Public Schools, and the way they spend their money is just crazy. And you know, I, I, they keep coming back and back to the city for more and more. You know. Uh, and granted, we don't have to do anything with you know, they're a partner of ours, but I just I, I like that idea a little bit more. Not maintaining their facility, the facility's already there. That's their responsibility, but focusing more on the programs and the this is not maintaining, and right? the hiring of the people and the you know that type of stuff. 
what you think? It's not maintaining though. It's like jump, helping them jumpstart this community. But they well, still have to maintain. I think to to Reed's point that the cost of the head building maintenance and janitorial the services is like that. Not be. And I suppose you can make the argument that those are they're there to support youth activities, and it's it's. it's that is the that would be the argument. That would be the, the argument. It's but the not actually. The air conditioning is for those activities. Right. The um, youth activities. And so I can see the other point of, but that's not actually want actual programming to go there. Correct. Right. Um, I mean, I think. Have the activities without a facility. True. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, um, but is it our responsibility to fund the facility that Little to Public Schools owns? You know, give it to us, and then we'll maintain it. I'm just thinking. The way I'm looking at this is that. We have the money. We use it for youth programs. This was one option, right. well thought out, a lot of community engagement. I think we should take it seriously, and I think oh, we yeah. should do it, make a decision in a timely manner. And it's an area of the community that I think would so benefit from it, would so benefit from this. And to show that partnership between the city, city government and LPS to get this up and running, it's just fantastic. To be able to, to talk about that in the media. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to start from scratch, like, let's get ideas and start this whole process over again, I, I, I don't think it was a good use of our money. Since we but but have, we, have we even reached out to the community? Does anybody know we have this money? I mean, we did we, reach out to the area. We reached out to our team. major, the most major partners. We've not done a full community engagement. Well, like North Littleton Promise, so, I mean, they should be involved in this conversation. They are, though. They are a partner in this. Yeah, they're a partner. They're sure. Sure. They're a partner Maybe they us. have their own. But separate. Yeah. They have their own program they want to get funded. Something else for their group. That's so we have two issues to, on this right. uh, this agenda item. We, we have the agenda item is directly about the one point two million dollars of stadium stadium district funding. That could be used for 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 any youth programs. The largest recommendation is the $750,000 or so for the uh, East uh, East <coughs> Community Center. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hearing some, some conversation that's kind of conflating both of those. I think one option for the council, since there is some urgency on the um, East Community Center, you could make a d decision on that tonight so we can let them know whether they, what, how they can plan. Um, you could give us, us direction to continue the conversation, broaden the outreach in the community for the remaining 500,000, 450 or whatever that is, um, and bring, you know, bring that conversation back to you if, if you don't feel like there's enough here. But there are those, those two questions. I mean, with specific to the East Community Center, I think it's a great idea. I really like it. I do think that... LPS put the cart before the horse a little bit. I mean, that was part of the concession for closing. <coughs> we'll, we'll do this without having the financing available and say we have the building and now we need to have the money. And I feel that you know they just expected Littleton to give all this money. I feel like they you know they could reach out to Centennial, um, some other partners yep. there. I know I, I hear you on the budget. I think it'd be good to say let's flesh this out. What's your what are the other partners do you have here? Are we, we're not the only ones putting money in here. I, I think it's worth continuing the conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily feel comfortable saying here's all 750 at tonight, but I think we need to kind of flesh that out a bit more. And, you know, I mean, is marketing and signage really vital to the youth activity program? I don't know. I think it, yeah. makes, it might make it vital to the success of the whole community center, but again, the community centers for broadly for the community, there'll be adult, um, you know, ESL classes or economics or you know, finance classes, things like that. And we're supposed to be focused on youth activity programs here. And I think this is a little broader than what our intended purposes for using these funds are at this point in time. This yeah, well put. My no, I think yeah, I think it's well said. I would, I would love to be able to give them all the money. And I just think it needs to be I a little agree. more. When we're looking at the, the the broader picture, I think LPS is probably going to be a main player in that. I think that that's, that's I mean, LPS is for you know student age um, children, so that works. I would like to have more outreach with 
sports activity you know, uh, with uh, sports organizations, with Town Hall Art Center. I mean, it seems like we did just LPS and South Suburban. Um, I think we could just put something in a little report, too. I mean, just to get it out there for people to know that it's even available. And I think we'll be surprised by who comes forward. You know, they might just come forward and say, hey, we need 20 grand for, for this new program. Um, and, and we have, I think we have plenty of time for, yep, I for too. that. I think it's the, the, the East Community Center was. I, the, I get you. Yeah, right. well, yeah they're driving. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that, they're driving this decision that we need to make regarding that money right now. I, I, my concern here is th this isn't the first time that East Elementary has been talked about over the last 30, 40 years. East has had this problem for a long time. The school board. The, are probably in a decision, do they sell properties or not? They don't want to sell a property, of course. But East has been on the block for decades. This is nothing new. Uh, this $700,000 isn't going to just save that that property. And if they're talking about, you know, I'm hearing about rents, yeah, we're going to, some people can't, some organizations can't pay much rent, so we're going to subsidize them. That, 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 that's just the way to go downhill and lose the property. I, 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 I'm not in a rush to give away this money just yet. Yeah, I, I do want to see it go toward youth programs, but I don't want to just say, well, let's hurry up and just save this program. Well, I haven't even seen a five-year plan yet. You know, what are they going to do if it doesn't survive this first year? The second year? Do they, like our DDA, I think we were going at starting with in the red, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the city. But there's a plan. We had 182 thousand dollars from the city. But there's a plan though that well, they'll, they'll 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 three mills out. and the right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All right next I, year, we're expecting maybe upwards yeah. of a million dollars. But the, with this plan, I, which I haven't seen yet, I'm concerned that it's going to stay in the red and then it'll just shut down altogether, and they're going to end up having to do something else with the property. Um, it, but this, what she explained to us, what Melissa explained to us. Uh, is wonderful. It's a great program. It sounds wonderful, but if it just isn't financially sustainable, uh, we really have to keep that in mind. Uh, and North East Littleton Promise, they've been around a long time. You know, they, they, uh, Maureen's done a great job running that program. They could use some of the money, probably. I'm sure they could use some of the money. And there's other organizations out there. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I don't want to just hurry up and make a decision just because they have to hear it right away. And I don't think they're using this one to, to save the property. I don't think they're going to they're going to sell it. I think it's to kickstart this community center. I mean, they're they're holding on to all their all their other their properties. So I mean, they came to it. I would imagine they would sit there oh. empty rather than selling. So I don't think that's even an option um, for them or anything for us to consider. About it's about it's about when they can't fund their schools. Yeah, you know? I mean they just how how the school district runs. I have no idea. Get rid of Tabor. That would help a lot. Tabor, <laughs> what's yeah. saved us? What are you talking about? Okay. Well, <laughs> Jared, I mean, I, I agree with you, man. Like, it's this, these community centers, in terms of their fiscal sustainability, are like, excuse me, are always. They, they taste bad, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was not part of this. <laughs> um, but. You know their fiscal sustainability for like cities like Golden, Fort Collins, like it's challenging. Like the, you know, school districts generally don't stand these up. It's usually a city, and those cities usually combine it with things like rec centers. They combine it with their sports, parks and rec programs, and stuff like that. So there is some sort of like more dedicated funding stream, and this one is kind of hanging out there on its own. And I went to three out of four of those meetings. Um, the need uh, for something, it not being a vacant building is certainly there, but um, yeah, I mean, I've obviously got concerns too. I mean, I'm hoping that if we're able to appropriate at least a portion of the fundings for this kind of phase one startup, that it comes with some sort of MOU, and I'm not sure if that was anticipated, um, but putting together an MOU, uh, an operational MOU, for the dedication of those funds saying we need to see these kinds of milestones being hit, um, you know, at these kinds of stages, otherwise other tranches may not be available. Um, and I, that sounds a little harsh and short, you know, so. putting things on a short leash, but like it's, um, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. it's, and I would it's feel really hard. So much more comfortable if, if South Suburban was in for a half million, if Centennial was in for a half million, little if it was if the this, county, the, yeah. the county, county chipped in and, something. I mean, this has been the plan for over 
a year, almost two now. I know. Um, stadium district funds only popped up when the Broncos sold, so that wasn't. I mean, the funding wasn't there when they had this community center idea, and it just kind of fell into our lap that they were hoping that they could sit next to us. And... But you know, the, on, the, on the flip side of it, a vacant large property like that will quickly become problematic for that neighborhood like it won't it's not just going to be a neutral piece of land it will be problematic and so if we're not doing exactly this at that full scale something we we are invested in it either way because we're it, it is still in our city limits and so we'll need to figure something out it's in our benefit to make a community center well, work absolutely. there absolutely. yeah or something's got to work it doesn't something. have to be a community center it could be something else it could be housing and this has been a problematic property for Littleton School Board for a long time, like I said. They were going to close it down 20 years ago. Then they were going to bring in a charter school. There's been a lot of plans. They've been, it's been hanging on there. And, and the Littleton Public Schools, you know, they, they are working hard to, to keep buildings open. But they are also understand the realities. They, things are going to have to close, and then what? Uh, a vacant building would not be good, but... A decision will have to be made. It may not be our decision. And maybe there's some sort of rider if in the eventuality of the proceeds of a sale that we can rededicate that money towards something. We talk about affordable housing. That would be a perfect place. Because the, the folks that are going to utilize that community center, for the most part, not all, are folks whose fees aren't going to support that property. So it's, it's gonna always going to be more money coming in. Going up. If it were to turn it into affordable housing, that's a different deal. It's a perfect location. It's a really challenging financial model. So what I'm hearing is council would like to continue this discussion with LPS, try to figure out how we can make something work here, but kind of tighten some things up and, and see more on their budget side, who the other partners are. Um, I'm hearing more than just a single year. I voted a five-year plan or a little bit more about sustainability following the first year. Um, and more specificity towards the youth activity programs and not, you know, the marketing. Yeah, it's going to be overhead per se. I think yeah. probably council may feel more comfort, or at least I would, if there was maybe some more information about what it would be going to, what those monies would be going to outside of kind of the overhead and, kind of refurbishment of, of making that site suitable. In order to honor what it is. Right. Yeah. And I think the, the overhead is that's what they're logical, I mean, but I they would say all those programs to deliver the sports, the education, all those different programs for kids, you need the overhead is what they would say. Right. Um, yeah, what is the sport? Right. But well, it, I think this idea is like, not just benefiting kids. I mean, the design of the site is to benefit, you know, small businesses and their location, right. other Some of the community groups important. that could have their yeah. meetings there. That's not the intent of the brain of different things Correct. which aren't specific to. So if we were funding, you know, if youth activities were 30% of their activity there, it so I think 30, you know. that's information, you know, I think they're, they're going to get pretty quickly to their next round of clarity with the RFI process to know who they're leading, um, nonprofit users will be. And I think we can bring back more information on, you know, which those are and to what extent they're serving serving youth activities. And, and that property is so important to that neighborhood over there. That something's got to be like, can't be an empty property where the grass looks, because uh, there was a couple years ago that grass didn't look good. A lot of people didn't like that. But, so something's got to happen. So it's got to happen, as Steve would say. It's got to. In addition to all the things that the mayor mentioned, to uh, Jerry and Pat's point, see what other uses there might be for the fund so that we really have a comprehensive list and, and then can evaluate beyond just the six things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm supportive of it that you bring up a good point that we need to maybe do a little bit more due diligence. But I do think it needs to be somewhat timely because they're waiting. I look, yeah, and I look at the number of people that it could potentially touch, you know, not only the kids, but the parents in that community. There's a large number of people that that, that community center could actually It would help them 
Right, funds are supposed to be for kids, kids but the money is supposed to go towards you. Right. Well, the kids and their parents. The children are okay. supposed to be for kids. That's <laughs> even <laughs> kids and their parents. It says kids. You know, one thing you could do with LPS, because um, it was very clear that Melissa said that they are best in they are vested in this project and they wanted to work. When you asked about alternative funding, if the city says no. So one thing that you could do is continue the conversation, uh, maybe let them know we're heading in one direction, and then they could come back and say these are specific youth programs right, that we mm -hmm. will be providing next year or or early in late this fall or something that they could come back and, and then you could talk through maybe some of those programs since we're not time constricted. Something on. more specific. Yeah. I mean, and I don't think we're heading in either direction. I think we're probably more on the support it somehow, but let's right, figure yeah. exactly that. Yeah. That's a good message. That's a good reaction. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't want it to say like, we're leaning towards, yeah, no, we don't want to do it. I think it's the opposite of that, right. but I think we're not comfortable with where the conversation so, is. And then is there, Just needs to is there the additional faster. feedback on the, the other programs identified for district-wide? So, say that again? The youth programming that was identified district-wide, is there any additional feedback as we go back? Well, it seems like for that. OPS, so for, you know, yeah. the campus. Right, so, well, so, it's for um, the summer, summer, camp. summer camp program there, but it's and then the STEM program. So yes. those are those are actual mm -hmm. programming elements right. um, that are offered for district-wide, so the EPIC would be something that everyone in the district can access. So is there any additional questions that council has on those, those programs? Because those are youth right. programming. I think those specifically, would, at least to my point, is... You know, I don't. I don't want the city of Littleton to be the only one doing everything district wide. When we're when we have LPS has more than just Littleton. And Littleton has more than just LPS. You know, um, you know. I know they have a small portion in probably five kids in Douglas County Schools or something. And I don't know how many live in Trailmark. That's in Jeffco. Um, but I don't want to also. We often forget about Trailmark and, and Douglas County. So let's also think about: Is there anything yeah. that we can do that would support those communities as well? With this or other stuff so i think we need to have some more conversation of what other you know do the what is it the, the little some hawks what's the hockey team or whatever if, if they have if there's some of these the there's a i think a youth rugby soccer basketball mm -hmm. some of these things do they have any needs to, i'm sure they do um how could the city how could these funds use to support that yeah well south suburban manages many of those things for city little all of those things for city Littleton. There's things that South Suburban can't do because they don't have the resources to do it. True, but they, re I mean, so the city, we did reach out to South Suburban. They said, yeah, we don't have any need for these funds. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think I think it was more on the programming side. Right. Who, who was it that said they don't have any need Executive for director. Funds? It was him, he who said that, the guy who's going out the door. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I also get, but I also get it too because the, it's, you know, they've got a very steady revenue stream and this probably complicates them and eats up more of their operational expenditure than like helps them in the long run a for a one time. time. Yeah, like it'll take more money for them to manage a one time fund than it will really for them to like benefit. But yeah, I can I'm thinking there's I mean I'd like the, you know the uh, local partnership grant opportunities here with with that idea of hey is there a youth I uh, mean youth uh, theater group that would love to I know I mean I know South, South Suburban put on a youth theater thing, but if there was another group that would want to do programming in the parks for the town, hall, town hall, they would, would love to have another building to rent where they could do right. stuff. And that's yeah. which the community center could do too. Yeah, but also, do they need that. some funding for a, a youth uh, program in the summer mm -hmm. or something like that? So I think mm -hmm. we need to have some more options. And those would probably be much smaller asks. Um, but if we could say, if we had a hundred thousand dollars to put towards. A granting opportunity specific towards youth programs that could be something that would be i'm actually more inclined to do that than and no offense to the interns of the world or anything but i'm more inclined to do some sort of like youth city led youth grant program thing that kind of weaves into our other kind of grant programs that we have i agree so that thing. could you know Through augment the, the tax yeah. the arts and culture but also hit the, the, the sports side of it as well yeah exactly like i think there i think that might be a little bit more honest to the to the intent of it, maybe. Yeah, I, I and feel it. it might be a little bit more flexible for us to administer that. It's more of a direct line. It seems seems like it. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, but if we in a few weeks we're, we're kind of stuck in the we're, like we're kind of here again, right? I mean, I'd still be comfortable putting up you know <laughs> a half a million. 
that still leaves us a comfortable like 700 grand to either dole out in other tranches or put two or three hundred thousand towards uh, a city administered. I mean, we could we could uh, you know buy every single youth in the city a, a shirt that looks like Keith, so when they ride their bikes, they're visible. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see Steve's shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Steve is that's uh, that's that's the same <laughs> this conversation. <laughs> Just sorry, I got got distracted. <laughs> It's rare that my shirts get overshadowed by another <laughs> shirt. Who's out there? He said, "With the local partnership funding, we can start small and see what comes out." And he said, "If we dedicate fifty thousand and see what organizations say, hey, I, I, we could use new nets for our soccer field or, yeah. or new jerseys or something that support those." But I also agree with you. I'd like to see what other. We're gonna, I'd, I'd like to see what other groups are ponying up for this as well. Like, are they having the same kinds of conversations that we are? There are some cities that have already spent the funds. Some of them, know they have. I mean, some of them only got like three dollars. Some of them got millions of dollars. We're really in the middle of, you know, in terms of timing. You know, many cities are just starting this conversation. Um, so we we have have time. I think what I'm hearing, Mayor, if I may, is that. We have some uh, some follow up to have with the district about the uh, east the east uh, community center, um, and then we'll get back to you. You know, as soon as is is practical practicable within a couple study sessions um, with so with with those answers, um, and then I think I'm hearing on the other needs that were uh, brought forward tonight. We can keep those in the hopper. Um, not discarding them yet um, on all all fronts, but then I'm hearing that you're you're looking for a little more community engagement um, around the rest of that potential funding. Or really, you know, we'll just kind of put out the word, um, have some process there. Um, I think if there were interest in a in more community partnership grants or what grants focused on youth activities, we might want to bring that into the broader grants cycle that we have. Um, so if I'm on the right track with what you're hearing, we'll move, move forward in that way. So we'll kind of plan iterative check-ins on this, this funding over the next six months, you know, leading up to that potential grant process, um, six or eight months, and we'll, you know, allocate the funding as, as council is, is comfortable with, with the answers we need. Okay. Work for everyone. This was good. Yep. Give us some direction. All right. Thank you. All right. Will anybody need a break? No. Yes. Thing over with. Five minute break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like before, before the Lorax comes up here and speaks for the trees, we can uh, <laughs> take a break. <laughs>
We're back. Uh, next topic of discussion is uh, our urban forestry management plan update. Thanks, Mayor. I'll say this is one of our most uh, exciting programs as I've seen coming along, you know, over just the last couple of years. Well, I haven't been here that long. But, uh, <laughs> he was excited and I've been watching it. I'll take where, it. <laughs> after only a couple of years. Uh, I'll take credit for that. <laughs> But um, I'll say, you know, taking care of our tree canopy, our, our urban forest, is really critical for the long term of the community. Um, and I'll only say, and I, I know Keith will speak to it too, I think as you hear the work that's been done and the master plan, um, a lot of our environmental stewardship goals are um, inherent to this plan. Um, a lot of good gains that we're trying to make and that we have a real good start on, you'll, you'll hear about. In, in addition to the aesthetics and just the value for the overall look and feel of the community. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Keith, who can introduce our other, other staff. You, you met both of these two and me a couple weeks ago. We were talking about cutting trees down versus not. So, um, so yeah, this is a, you know, when uh, I've been here about six years now, and Kelsey's been here a couple at this point, maybe a little longer. Probably feels like 10. And then, uh, so it's, it's, part of, it's part of our strategy within, um, with our grounds and our open space operations was we, we really didn't have a long-term forestry strategy. Um, there's a huge value in your urban forest and your urban canopy, and we just didn't have that. And so that was one of the major undertakings that we've done and bringing Mary and uh, some other staff on her team on board to really pioneer us through that and get us to the next stage. Um, there's so many things that tie into this from a conservation standpoint, water resources, um, equity, heat islands for development, and all those things. So it's really big. And, and some of the work that um, Kelsey and Mary have been doing is really at the leading edge of this kind of work in Colorado because one of the things that we talked about from the start is is you know you can spend your time focusing on the canopy that you have today but the work we put in today this is one of those areas where the work we put in today really pays dividends 20 30 40 years down the road for us as a community so part of that question is what do we want that to be <clears throat> And, and with all the things that we're facing from water resources, climate change and all that, and disease. And so that's really kind of the basis where we started. And they've done some really exciting work, and they're going to share it. And also, it's and we are at the leading edge of this kind of work here in Colorado, which is pretty exciting. So, And Mary has agreed to not use the word ooze tonight, <laughs> like the last time we were here. Ooze. No more <laughs> ooze or canker um, talk. Talking about Maybe. honey loaders. So. <laughs> So we had a forester before we had uh, city manager at that time got rid of them or changed them. Was that six years ago? No. So we had um, our grounds manager, Kelsey's predecessor, was listed as our city forester. That was Dave, right? Yeah. And but beyond that, we didn't really have we had no strategic plan. We didn't have a maintenance plan or any of those kind of things. It was just more reactive to what our forest was doing over time. So we had a forest or we just didn't utilize it say the, the way we use yeah. it. Yeah, we were definitely um, in Kelsey more has one heck of a title. That says a whole lot. I know. It's like a <laughs> business card and a half. Yeah, really. So, I mean, really the strategy before, like, you know, in some of our other service areas was very much driven by reactive work versus setting a standard of where we want to go and then planning that proactively to get there. And that's, this is a reflection of that change in philosophy. Great. Thanks. Um, so we are at a point that we want to share our management plan with council just to get some feedback before um, we move into finalizing this document. Um, and one thing I did just want to clarify is um, this is a management plan, not a master plan. Um, typically, management plans are, um, forestry management plans are very internal based, um, looking at internal inventory, so uh, trees within the right of way, within your parks that you maintain. Um, we found through this process that um, we own and maintain very little land. Um, as a result, we have the smallest amount of trees um, uh, compared to homeowners, and um, well, we'll get into that later in the presentation. But uh, as a result, what we ended up doing was um, expanding the footprint of this management plan a little bit more um, out into 
what it's going to take to get some residences, um, private, private residents involved, South Suburban involved, um, knowing that in five to 10 years, we will probably want to pursue a formal master plan. So um, very much a starting base um, uh, to grow upon. So, um, so this is building from the ground up. Building from the ground yes. up. Yeah, so I'm going to let <laughs> Mary... Sprouting and branching <laughs> out. God, I was holding on to this one for it. so long. <laughs> <laughs> so many tree vines. <laughs> living out there. <laughs> So, <laughs> so the core of what we're going to be working on over the next couple of years is internal focused um, with a large focus on trying to stabilize our existing conditions. Um, I don't think at this time the resources would be worth it to pursue a greater master plan um, until we really stabilize our existing conditions. Um, Littleton, like other communities in the area, are experiencing pretty serious canopy decline. Um, we've got a lot of challenges that we're going to review um, over these next couple slides, um, but really our core focus is just to try to maintain existing conditions. Um, I'll let Mary kick it off with some benefits of uh, Oh, sorry. I've got two computers in front of me. <laughs> yeah. I, I, recently, I was looking at a picture of, a, I was up in Greeley, I have some stuff up there I do. And uh, I was looking at the existing Greeley today from the air, trees all over the place. But I looked at one from like 100 years ago. It was dirt. No trees. Mm -hmm. right. So in desert. We should put cactus back. So we're not a whole lot different than that, I don't think. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit different from a climate standpoint, just soil differentiation mainly, but generally, yes. So what would have been native in our corridor would have been falling water. So cottonwoods, willows, and a lot of wild cherry kind of species. Um, that being said, Greeley's a good example. They were kind of ahead of their time. Shiloh, their urban forester, has worked there for like 30 years, and he has been, he's won a ton of awards on leading their campaign. So they're really, um, good example of hope of saying like, oh, if this is completely <coughs> done and we're putting in efforts and the infrastructure to grow trees, they do grow here. It's just not, it's not the native landscape that you're seeing. So. <laughs> okay. <It's done>. Continue. <laughs> well, now I need to talk about benefits of trees, so it'll be an hour. <laughs> um, this slide shows some of the benefits of trees starting, I guess, with the urban forest defined. It's anything that's growing, any trees that are growing within the city. So I studied urban forestry, and I would say the most common uh, response I got to telling people that is, that's an oxymoron, because it feels weird to have urban and forest together. Um, but kind of to your it's point. like a rural city. Yes, exactly. And so <laughs> so to the, to the point of there weren't trees natively here, but there are also weren't cities and buildings natively here. So that was when the um, art of urban forestry kind of came in to, to try to kind of mitigate that um, change. So looking at the benefits of trees, specifically in urban environments, they clean the air as second grade science teaches they take carbon and make oxygen. So we need trees to breathe. They do cooling. Um, trees have been associated with decreasing cardiovascular disease and obesity rates, as well as asthma rates. Obviously, biodiversity and um, then managing stormwater and increasing property values. So there's a ton of benefits to trees. I will say that um, dependent on location, size, maturity, and the um, care of the tree, this is all like directly benefited with that. Okay, so kicking off our uh, management plan, the first thing we had to do last year was start collecting data. Um, so we, we really based this plan off of two core sets of data. The first was a inventory and risk assessment. Uh, the second was a larger urban tree canopy assessment for the entire city. So the first one was looking at what Littleton, the city of Littleton maintains internally. So we have about uh, 4,400 trees throughout the city. Uh, you'll see um, on the right there, those are mapped out in Cartograph, our asset management system. Um, so a lot of trees within right-of-way corridors. Um, <coughs> part of that risk assessment, um, which was done through the Colorado Tree Coalitions, 
um, assessment looks at likelihood of failure, um, likelihood of target impact, consequence of failure, uh, species, and then finally a recommended action uh, for each tree. And so recommended actions are uh, removal, hazard mitigation, reevaluate, and then no action required. As you can see, uh, we've got 46% of our canopy was recommended for some sort of hazard mitigation, whether that is some sort of um, just structural pruning or a full removal. Um, it's a little more than we want to see. Um, and so this has really driven uh, the development of our internal operation uh, work plans. Uh, you know, we've, we talked last year, we secured funding for um, um, citywide clearance pruning within the right of ways to address um, the results from this. As a, just as a side note to that, one of those things that's important for the, the clearance pruning is that that has a huge impact as we do more street maintenance and more capital maintenance because oftentimes those trees have I actually witnessed this early in my career I watched trees go up while they were paving a street um, so you know that if you don't get out there and do some of that mitigation in advance of your capital work it can really be a problem when you're out there you know actually doing road work as well none of the trees you're talking about include any of the parks that are managed by South Suburban. No. Okay. Um, and to our knowledge, they don't. They have not done uh, a recent inventory and risk assessment. Um, they did do an inventory in the past, um, but as far as going in um, to this level, um, is not something that we have for our parks yet. And the trees for this section moving forward, the maps are looking the canopy cover is considering the trees in residential areas in South Suburban, okay. but not our that not four thousand number isn't ours. So yeah. That's only um, city maintained trees. Gotcha. So moving into the um, citywide urban tree canopy assessment or a UTC. Um, a UTC is developed by the Forest Service in 2006 and it's basically just trying to understand the distribution of tree canopies within cities. It's measured by using um, high resolution GIS imagery and so it's looking um, above and taking in the different land cover and, and receiving that data and then producing maps so that it's easily um, processed. So looking at ours, the city of Littleton has increased by 10% in the last 10 years and we have data from 2013 that was done front range wide and then 2023. So we can see that we've lost 5% of our canopy in the last 10 years. 5% um, seems kind of like a small number trees are growing so that is a little bit of a red flag because we should be naturally if we're passive we should be seeing an increase which means that we're likely seeing um, canopy due to or canopy reduction due to development is pretty much what we can guess Littleton's was um, and looking at pests and diseases and that kind of thing as well but that would be smaller um, looking at what Davy Resource Group Con we contracted them to do the UTC. They cover, they assess land cover classification, land use, neighborhood and census block groups, and then the urban heat temperatures. So those are the four um, like big groups of data they collected. And then from that, they created a social equity index map, which is um, what's heavily talked about at the end of the management plan. And we certainly talk about it in the PowerPoint as well. So I'll save it till then. Um, since uh the mayor asked this question. So, um, so in the plan that you've seen, some of the benchmarks we that Davy used were um, other cities that were similar in size, although they may be in different parts of the country. Um, so we took a pulled the data from 2013 related to the front range as a whole. So we have some comparative data to other communities. If you want to touch on that for a sec. Yeah, and um, well, so the first piece is the, the cities that you see in the plan are similar in size and density. So it's really looking at like available plantable areas within the city. Um, we do realize a lot of them are in the Midwest and in California. We had that same question. I don't know, I didn't, I don't know if council, so I asked a question, why are we comparing um, 
cities in California, Illinois, Indiana for tree canopy percentage at 50%. You know, they're totally different uh, climate. I mean, we, is that, that's, that's where that's coming from. I didn't from. even hear that question. <laughs> I emailed. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. He was psychic. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, so those, that's why those are in there. But we did, we, we did go back to that 2013 front range study that they did, and it um, pulled canopy data for all the major cities in the front range. And uh, at that time, the average was 16.4%. Um, we were at 25% uh, at that time. So we were above the average. Um, looking at similar cities, so um, Inglewood had a 24% canopy at that time. Um, one thing I do want to note is um, Boulder had a 27% canopy at that time. Uh, since then, they've uh, experienced EAB and other uh, environmental impacts, they've lost 25% of their canopy since that study was done. Um, so just a little future of what could happen to us if we're not proactive. So. Dangers of hugging trees. <laughs> <laughs> um, we pulled this today, so it didn't make it into the PowerPoint, but I'm happy to pass this around if you want to look at other cities in the Denver metro area. And this is from 2013. It was the Front Range Wide Study. So we don't have anything on 2023 data for other cities also limited to what cities actually do canopy studies, so. <laughs> okay, long-term goals. So um, the biggest goal I would say is to foster sustainable and equitable urban canopy. Looking at that um, broken down, it's gonna start with increasing canopy. So as Kelsey mentioned at the beginning, we're just trying to maintain and kind of stay stable for um, the next few years into 2030. And that's largely due to some of the upcoming challenges that we have that we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, and then after that, we're wanting to increase 5% every 10 years until the ultimate long-term goal is a canopy cover of 50%. And I included this because it's wild. We if we increase 5% every year, we'll reach that by the year 2090. Mm -hmm. So though it feels daunting, I have that cute little picture of a society grows great when old men plant trees who shade, they know they'll never sit. So trees are um, slow moving while we're in an ever, ever quickly fast paced environment, trees are staying steady. And so that's something that is definitely kind of daunting, but is also encouraging knowing you're not you're not planting these for you, you're planting these for the folks in the future. Well, I planted the trees in my yard for me. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I guess it, if you plant them early enough, you can count them for you. <laughs> um, so that's um, something, I guess, to keep in mind. And then increasing diversity is one of our big long-term goals. This 5-10-20 rule is 5% of the same species, no more than 5% of the same species, 10% of the same genus, and 20 of the same family. So an example of that is is, um, locust trees. We don't want any more than 10% of locust trees in one area so that if a disease happens, yeah. <laughs> which we have a good example of 90% locust trees and why it's devastating. So that rule is um, following our big, bigger scope of things, but also looking at street specific, park, park specific, and um, ash is another example of that. So if we're keeping 10% or less of ash trees, then it's a feasible number to deal with when EAB comes. So that's kind of the, um, to secure some level of financial stability and not be caught off guard. The diversity rule really helps with that. Can we get rid of all the crab apples? <laughs> we will wow. not get rid of them, but I would <laughs> love to increase them. And I feel like you've looked at the slides. <laughs> um, definitely want to increase Just diversity on the crab apple route so that we're not caught with a monoculture of this is all crab apples. If one gets a disease or a pest, then they all spread. So um, hoping, to in, hoping to convert that into some level flowering tree route and still have beautiful trees. Um, then increasing equity canopy in canopy coverage. So tree equity defined as having enough trees in an area so that everyone can equally experience the health, climate, and economic benefits of trees. And we'll certainly touch on that later. And then last long-term goal is just reducing risk. So we know that 47% of our trees are needing some level of attention due to risk. And that's something that will clearly be a priority, and then we hope to move quickly into a pattern of proactive rather than reactive. It's cheaper and it's safer. Oh, it's probably a good place to ask this question on this slide with the, I guess, the equity and canopy. Are there, is the plan, acknowledge some 
perhaps species of trees we don't want. I'm trying to think of uh, any invasive species or yes. hosts of, I mean, you know, main one I think of is Ilanthus, the tree of heaven. Mm -hmm. you know, I know it's a beautiful tree, people have it, but that's a host to so some pretty devastating oh, no. invasive species. Right. Um, so. Don't say maple. Jerry, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we have to pull those out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that we've um, recommended, and we will touch on that later, is code updates to be able to achieve the goals. And part of that is creating a tree manual that has kind of an appendix of trees. Like, here's what we recommend, here's what's prohibited, and then here's what you're allowed to plan, but we have a lot of, and we're trying to increase diversity, so we encourage you to stay away. Um, so some that are illegal and then others that are just kind of discouraged. <laughs> Try to aim for some of the more water efficient. Yes, Jesus certainly. This is filled with tamarisk. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Some of that already is laid out in ULUC, um, which is great. Um, but then through working with a consultant to develop some code, recommended to code changes, they did look at the ULUC and enhance some of those what's written in there. Um, that'll come at a later presentation. We didn't get those code updates back until last week. Um, and then you know, we'll have to work through how to implement them and, and what we want to what we want to put where. So They look really good, though. <laughs> they so. They're not in the current. Mm -mm. They're not, no. It's so, so like an information overload also <laughs> from my <laughs> meat absorbing it all, at least. <laughs> OK. So. Upcoming challenges. So um, a lot of these we've already hit on, and I think most of y'all are familiar with, but Emerald Ash Borer, um, we haven't had it confirmed here yet, but we're certain that it will yes. be coming. So it's something that we're already preparing for. Um, for perspective, we're treating one third of our healthiest ash trees, which is about 150 of them, and we expect that to cost nine thousand dollars per year. So we're it's currently treating them. We'll start this summer. Should those of us that have our emerald ash be doing the same thing? I would say maybe yeah. this summer or next. <laughs> if you want to keep it, yes. Yeah. By, by next summer, I would say for sure it's treating ash trees. So what we're trying to do this year is we treat it as a city and we'll mark the trees so that people are like, oh, the city is treating it. It's, it's time to start treating it. So it's impossible to really guess its trajectory because right now we thought it would be in Denver and it seems like it's kind of going around the bug is, but it looks like it travels through corridors. So we'll likely get it through something like Highland Canal or Santa Fe. And we'll be doing a pretty robust public engagement um, this summer at all of our events to start notifying the public um, How's of options. Doing that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we did some initial outreach last summer at Meet, Greet, and Eats. Mm -hmm. uh, we really want to ramp that up um, this year, um, both in person, um, through mailers, um, through presence on our website, social so media. It'll be on the website. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the good, part, the good part about the, the ash borer coming in other parts of Colorado first is we've really been able to see how other communities have dealt with it, what lessons we can learn from that. Um, I, I live in a community where they've treated the trees in my yard. You know, I've had to treat mine. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it'll help us really learn from that, take some of those lessons learned to help all the community members because that's where most of the ash trees lie mm -hmm. are on people's property. Have you worked with the Department of Agriculture, or USDA, about uh, notifying the public with various invasive species or pests like the ash or spotted liner fly to keep aware of, hey, if you see these things, let us know because that's a problem. You it's something know. that's coming up. Um, I am a member of the Front Range Urban Forestry Council, and the members of the USDA come there and Department of Ag are there every month. So. I feel very up to date on that. Something I would like to see us do as a city is be posting that on our website and have it kind of like we have a lot of information on trees and here's some of the pests to be looking for. Um, so internally, I'm certainly checking in our shops where the trains are where we think we'll see spotted lantern fly first because of the post. If you see this, kill it and then let us yes. know. Yeah. <laughs> Not in the opposite direction. Yes. <laughs> also take a picture because I've looked at an awful lot of cottonwood <laughs> trees that people think have EAB. <laughs> it's like that's not how the pest works. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe we want photos first. But yeah, I think I think it's a good idea and something we should promote on the website as a pretty easy way to show photos and stuff. 
Um, okay, on to Highland Canal as an upcoming challenge. So right now we've taken on about two miles of it. Within that is 870 trees that are over 10 inches DBH or bigger, so fairly substantial. Um, obviously the water isn't running in it anymore from Denver water, so we're seeing a pretty quick decline with that. Noteworthy enough is 82% of that canopy is cottonwood, which are trees that are vulnerable to drought. So they're getting large. They've gotten used to a certain amount of water, and now the water isn't being provided. So we're certainly seeing the dieback there, and it's something that uh, we're working with the Conservancy to try to kind of set us up for success as we're adopting more parts of the canal. I think we have a total of five or six miles in all of Littleton that mm -hmm. we will eventually get to. Crabapple route, so coming back to that point, the main thing is that we're, we love the crabapple route and we want to protect it in a way that's sustainable. So looking at transitioning it into a flowering tree route feels like the best way to um, mitigate that while keeping, keeping people happy, keeping the legacy going, but not putting ourselves into a situation that we're promoting a monoculture that runs through our entire city. Um, declining canopy, we've hit on that one pretty good, but it's just generally we know that we have work that needs to get done and we know that infrastructure needs to be there to support it, like irrigation and um, spacing for, in you know, tree pits and that kind of Council thing. Council Member Valley's had a question. Yeah, you had mentioned like the Highland Canal, cottonwoods and all that good stuff. Kittering has, and Gallup has a lot of cottonwoods. What about the rest of our park? <laughs> It's not a majority. Um, I can tell you the actual number. It's in our. It's in one of our higher percentages, but it's not our largest tree percentage. Species percentage is ash, which is common in the front range. For it sure. seems like the cottonwoods that we do have city are dying. Yes, I think that. I think, I mean, that, my yard. Mm -hmm. I think and we're, we have the big trees surrounded by the fence over. Right. They also have a lifespan. Yes, yes. <laughs> There's the natural life cycle mixed with people don't think about it's, supplemental watering on mature trees a lot of times, and cottonwoods can take up, mature cottonwoods can take 100 gallons of water a day. So it's... How much of our housing stock was built in the 50s and 60s? A lot of mm -hmm. people planting tree. Yes. The trees <laughs> live about 60, 70 years old, and right. that's where we're at right now. So we built our park. as a lot of those people are retiring, so are the trees. Yeah, yeah. It is 13% of our overall city maintenance. 13% <laughs> 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 is high. So ash is our highest, then cottonwood, then pine, and then oak are our top four species. So, yeah. They're not all bad trees, just something to keep in mind that we can try to ease the loss of them. If it is aging out, then to try to soften that blow rather than losing a big percentage at the same time. Um, okay, and then the last one is limited land owned and maintained by Little Tim. This is our biggest challenge. So of the total 9,000 acres that's Little Tim, we only maintain about 80 acres. Um, so on this slide, you can see the most noteworthy is our largest. So everything is uh, listed from highest to lowest on acreage. So we have the highest percent is residential at a little over 3,000 acres. And then next is parks and rec. So mainly south suburban land with 1,500. And from that, we have only 17.8%, oh, sorry, 15.2% of the tree canopy cover, which compared to it taking almost 18% of our land is a number that we would really like to see increased. Um, a lot of times cities target parks as planting locations. Most of the time they're already irrigated. It's not in a street tree pit. It's a, a fairly plush environment. And so that's something that we're definitely wanting to um, work to align ourselves with South Suburban's forestry goals so that we're on the same page because we will not be able to meet our long-term canopy goals if we can't have um, our partners on board. And that's one that we've targeted as something that we're wanting to there's a little skew there, too, because how about half of that is South Suburban, a South Platte Park, and then a good portion of that is water, water. so you can't really plant trees. And So that, the water is 8%. Right, but it's not included here, so would that be part of that, of those acres of the city right there, or did you, did you exclude the water from this? Yeah, the, the water is 8% overall mm -hmm. um, of the city, and the, the percentage of that, the park, the actual acreage of the river is not really huge, comparatively speaking, because of all the other parks. That we have beyond that, about 600 of that is South Platte Park, yeah. statistically. So, 
you know, that's, that's about a third of it. But at the end of the day, um, the river, the river takes into account. That's also the, and one. the lakes that are over in the park as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's in there. But at the end of the day, we would, we would expect if you compare this ratio to other cities, whether it's, you know, in the front range or elsewhere, this is a spot where we'd expect a higher percentage of tree canopy in those open spaces. So it sounds like getting South Suburban involved as a yep. good partner is really that is that is important to our long term strategy. <laughs> and to align with tree goals to make sure we hear their goals, they hear our goals and find that mm-hmm. alignment there. Oh, oh. I forgot I did it. Gosh, that was good. Did you guys see that <laughs> the spin? Now, now it clicks. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. High quality graph. I forgot. <laughs> 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 I, uh, I interrupted. That was a change that was my this afternoon. <laughs> Those were, were the numbers she was referencing. Back again. <laughs> back again. I, I do want to highlight. Back that one up. <laughs> Exactly. So I will highlight one thing that is related to the work in the ULUC over time is that if you look at some of those um, bottom four uses, um, commercial, institutional, uh, mixed use, and industrial, um, if you look at some of our recent development over the last decade, they are heat islands. And even if you model out the trees that are in those right now, it's not going to have a huge effect over the next 20 years. So one of the things that we, we're going to be talking about overall from a staff and a ULC, ULUC perspective is a combination of things. It's not just tree canopy. It's re- reducing the amount of impervious surfaces, for example, which contribute to that heat island effect. If you look at something like, say, Aspen Grove, I mean, a, a massive amount of that is asphalt. And so the question for us as a community is, is twofold is yes how do we work the tree canopy and other native species into that but at the same time how do we work towards development regulations that gradually reduce that that heat island footprint over time with more pervious surfaces so that we can not only do better with water quality but reduce that overall temperature effect of development regardless of the of the type it is in the community like what's the ideal surface Natural. <laughs> I mean, I have. Yeah, I mean, so that's one where I think, you know, if we look at that, it's working with the developer to find the right mix for them. Do you, you know, do you, do you have your, for example, your parking barriers be bigger with more um, pervious surfaces in them for more tree so trees can be more successful? Or do you, um, you know, work with developers to have pervious asphalt or concrete, for example, um, to, to be able to work that into development. So, and likewise for our own things that we're building, um, you know, we're experimenting with, you know, pervious concretes and pervious asphalts. For example, when we look at, um, you know, the green infrastructure opportunities in downtown, those are the kind of things that help you with water quality. So it's, it's a combination of tools to get us there. And I think with the, like the policy discussion, of that's the, you know, the density, mm-hmm. and, you know, Vertical, rather than having a one-story building in a giant parking lot, if you have a parking garage and four or five stories, that's more beneficial for that. You don't need to have yeah, that. Yeah, so I, th- I think it's a combination of all those tools to work with um, our goals as a community and at the same time our, our economic development goals to make all of those fit together. To me, it's a toolbox of opportunity, and we just have to work with um, our partners on the private side as development comes in to, to work with them to help find tools, and sometimes it's, it's incentivizing those opportunities. I, I guess what I was, I was really trying to get at is, it, you know, is it a blacktop, concrete, gravel, dirt, what, what would be the best well, for Mother Nature? Well, dirt, dirt, probably, dirt. probably dirt, yeah. natural soils, yeah. so topsoil. We know that's not going to happen. Yeah, so right now, Jerry, I have a few people telling me that our streets are gravel based on the amount of potholes out there. We wish they were you have the most permeable <laughs> streets <laughs> in the entire city. <laughs> gravel right. holes. Here's are the most permeable. <laughs> So, so that, I mean, and that's part of the, I think, the combination. And I mean, if you look at an example of that, too, is like when I look at it as a public works director, I look at a road like Broadway. You know, if you're greenfielding Broadway today through open land, you wouldn't build the, you know, the acreage and acreage and width of Broadway as it is. We, we just wouldn't build something that wide from not only a water quality, a heat island, but a, but also from a, um, a pavement preservation and cost. So, you know, those are just different strategies that we'll work in over time. And, you know, it, it's a constantly changing technology, so we'll just keep working at it. So. 
much sure you answered my question. Continue before you <laughs> Top soil <laughs> would be the best. <laughs> and horses. Might as well just get rid of cars. <laughs> and horses. Oh, okay. need more golf horses. <laughs> <laughs> Continue, please. <laughs> All right. No one else to counsel. Okay. I don't want to interrupt. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through. Um, so these are some of our action items over the next one to three years. So uh, obviously we have a lot of challenges ahead of us um, that are going to decline the canopy. Our it's a lofty goal just to maintain us at 20% over the next seven years through 2030. Um, so our action items are really focused on um, preserving the existing canopy um, and bringing our existing trees up to, um, to better health. Um, and then just really developing um, solid plans to um, sustain the newly planted trees that we put in the ground. Uh, we see in other cities where, um, you know, I think, Denver has like a 30% success rate or something with the, their newly planted trees. Um, Might even be lower. <laughs> yeah, so you're planting so many trees and many of them not making it to year two or three. Um, if we can really focus on early plant health care, we can be more successful in um, getting our, you know, spending less resources, making those trees last a lot longer. So, um, I won't read through all these, but... Now, if, if we were to hire a good attorney, he could probably legally put it together how how could we utilize this for sports and kids so we use that money <laughs> give every kid a charm. arbor day festival <laughs> <laughs> we're we're day. Day. we hired the good one <laughs> so looking at these maps that we got from the utc on the left is a neighborhood block map and then we're um, compare, trying to, <laughs> on the left is Keith's shirt, <laughs> and on the right is our canopy cover. <laughs> um, so we're trying to centralize our areas of focus as we're mainly focusing on preserving the trees that Kelsey was just getting to. So on the right, you can see the blue, darker shading equals denser canopy. So another way to think about that is the lighter spots are our potential planting spots. So that's the areas that we're wanting to increase planting now, and then we're wanting to preserve the canopy where we have it. So it's definitely um, a both and, not an either or, to see that success. And then if we'll go to the next one, to compare it with the heat island effect or heat island temperature map that um, Keith has already touched on a good amount, but you can see the canopy and the heat surface temperatures are almost directly um, related, so that's a pretty easy overlay. So the red is the hotter and then the blue is the cooler. Another way to look at that is red is areas that are in more need of tree canopy cover to reduce that heat. Um, one, one little statistic on that is heat-related illness causes more death than any other natural disaster each year. So even though we are talking about things like there's a lot of different options, impervious surfaces, increasing canopy, creating structure that trees can um, be successful in, there is a serious consequence that comes to these areas of extreme, these heat islands in urban areas. Um, and we do see that pretty consistently from looking at the heat island effect. And I think that's on page 12 of this, but there's a really nice visual that's showing when you're in, the, like going from like country to suburbs to urban to like metropolitan city, you can see in some cases like the city of Denver up to a 20 degree change in the summer. So it can be substantial given buildings and um, impervious surfaces and that kind of thing that are refracting the heat rather than trees that are absorbing it. And then achieving tree canopy equity. So we've got a few slides on these, but um, for this one, I'll primarily focus on Littleton is not in bad shape for this. Um, American Forests has done a study that's in larger cities and it gives them a score. The higher the score, the better. So Littleton's is 94. Um, looking at that compared to Denver, which is an 88, and then Westminster, which is scoring a 77. So the big thing that we're trying to um, focus on here is seeing what we have and what we're needing to do to make an equi equitable distribution of our trees. Of the, they divided out by census blocks. So of the 34 blocks, seven of them are under 94. So those census blocks will be our area of focus so that we can get equity up to there. And then if you go to the next one, I think there's the visual. Yeah. So then that map on the left is um, where we're seeing that. So it's a dense map, but 
Um, in short, on the right, we have all of the factors that go into creating a social equity score. And the scores are the numbers on the map. That's on also let's see, page 15 if you want to look at it up close so you can see the numbers better. Um, but the numbers, the higher the number, the higher the need. And then looking at the different colors. So blue and the little chart at the bottom, blue is looking at high index score, so high need and low canopy cover. So that's going to be an area we focus on. And then whereas orange is looking at a high canopy cover with a low need. So then the other colors are kind of fitting into that. And I do know we have a transition on this slide to show our areas of focus. So <laughs> to make that one clear, um, pointing out these are census block groups that we're wanting to start our initial focus on um, in the short to mid term time frame. And that's where a lot of our funding will be coming. We're trying to get funding from grant opportunities, but where a lot of our resources will be poured into because the reality is a lot of our efforts have to be focused in residential areas since we maintain such a small portion of our overall canopy and looking at these targeted neighborhoods that are um, clearly ranking below the rest and we're not seeing that equitable tree distribution gives us a good starting point. And then the hope is that we can um, redo this urban tree canopy study every 10 years ideally, but even if we were to do it a little bit shorter and see where the efforts, where we're able to quantify the efforts is a really easy way for us to um, sort and collect our data in, in a priority way. Does that, does that mean you're going to focus on those, get those up to a certain level, and then move to the other ones, or are you also doing things in the other areas too? Also doing okay. things in so. others. So we want we're wanting <coughs> to preserve and to plant. So the blue areas, and this is by no means an absolute, but the blue areas we would love to see a bigger focus on planting, whereas we're wanting to see a large focus on preserving in our other areas. So. One thing we certainly don't want to do is then focus on the blue areas, and then in ten years our blue and our orange have flopped. So we're wanting to we're wanting to keep a very sustainable approach to it. Um, that's focusing on spots that we know need increased canopy cover and are statistically hotter areas of our city, um, while still <coughs> making sure that we're prioritizing efforts in the spots that have a really healthy canopy, like um, Heritage. The big the brightest orange block there is those are great trees. Our stretch of the Highline Canal goes through there, so we're wanting to make sure we're focusing on that, knowing that the Highline Canal is going to be an upcoming challenge. So definitely, definitely keeping it large, large view on both. <laughs> And then this is the last one. Um, sometimes it's kind of hard to put, wrap your mind around the actual goals for it. So as I mentioned, seven of the 34 are below our score of 94. That is saying that we could plant 37,000 trees to make them in those areas to bring them up to the average score. Um, that being said, canopy cover isn't measured by the amount of trees planted. The larger the canopy, the cover is um, collected that way. So that would be if we had nothing and we were just counting on those newly planted trees. But the point of this in short is that it's a lot of, it is a lot of work and it's a lot of intentionality and in planting in these areas. It's not just something that's going to come because we have examples like Greeley where it's completely empty. Those trees were all intentionally planted and that's why we're able to see the um, forest that they have now. And then I was looking at some of the historic pictures of Littleton just a little bit ago. Mm -hmm. There were no trees in Littleton. Mm -hmm. So with, with, if we did all this planting now with a plan of some sort, you know, doing it reasonably, how it should be done? Youth activities. There. But what is, what is the point? <laughs> what is the point of uh, uh, diminishing returns? I mean, because of water. We have so many people moving here. So water is such a huge issue. But when is it? Yeah, you can plant trees, but they're going to need water. Certainly. And that's something where you're, from my perspective, you're having to weigh the cost benefit of trees. So yes, trees require water and they have an expense and they do die and we have to remove them. But at the end of the day, on the simplest form, we're needing trees to breathe. Not to mention, if we lost our canopy, we would have huge stormwater repercussions. We would have areas that, like of extreme smog and then there are the, the health benefits that, you know, we mentioned at the very beginning, but I think just on like its most stripped down form, trees are providing us a huge um, 
benefit. And we can quantify that on this slide. Um, so that was a great tee up. So looking at um, areas that we can see where the trees are, they are cooling our city. They are helping with collecting rainfall as it's coming. And then the roots are taking up stormwater as um, like flooding issues. So we're as dry as we are, it flooded on mineral on whatever day that downpour was. On Thursday, I was driving to a meeting. I was like, mineral has a flood spot here on it. And like, that's a good example to me where I'm like, okay, like we can work together to mitigate this <laughs> through true. pervious surfaces that are absorbing this through vegetation that's catching some of this fall. Because the reality is in Colorado, we often get those huge downpours of rain and that is really hard to manage. And I think vegetation is, all things considered, a really cheap infrastructure to utilize to kind of combat that um, versus some actual like concrete infrastructure. I don't know, trees are my thing. I don't know how you would word that. <laughs> Storm water. Well, Storm, like, water, Storm water, infrastructure. water infrastructure. Water quality insulation. <laughs> Green infrastructure is cheaper than, than, than digging. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're also at a point where we need to adapt and look at the species that we are planting. Oh. So it's unlikely that we're going to continue planting cottonwoods because we know how much water that they need. And so exploring other species that can adapt to lower water needs because we know that those challenges are coming is really key in our strategy. Um, so yeah, let's talk about money. Um, so uh, part of the UTC, we had them quantify our existing urban canopy. So that's the chart that you see on the right there. Um, total annual benefits, uh, $700,000 uh, when you look at stormwater and carbon and uh, particle matter. Um, total stored carbon, um, $10 million. So that is just on a rolling basis um, compared to our current annual expenses, uh, which is just under $500,000. Um, a big bulk of that is staffing and then some short-term programs. So um, EAB over the next three years, uh, excuse me, over the next five years, and then our citywide clearance pruning initiative over the next three years. So as those programs uh, come to an end, uh, we'll have to look at shifting the financial model for this division um, as our goals start to change uh, and we take on new programs. So additional resources needed, I will say for 2024, we're really not asking for anything um, <laughs> except for to continue what we already have in place. Retract, can you retract this? <laughs> we just had a budget meeting this morning. Can you retract this? Okay, okay, never mind. I don't know. We're not asking for like anything crazy. And by that, I'm asking for a lot. Kelsey's not. It's different. <laughs> So to achieve some of these more long-term goals, um, we do think anticipate that we will need another full-time employee. That's not something that we're coming for in 2024 by any means. Um, and then additional funding to actually plant and establish trees. Um, just the planting establishment of one tree is around $400 for that first year. So you know, there is a cost associated with it. Um, our citywide clearance uh, pruning that started this year. We hope to have that done. Um, through the next three years. Um, what are the Miller Balls? The Miller Balls alone. <laughs> we scheduled the flyover at the end of the race. We're easily distracted now. So push through. Um, and then EAB, obviously, um, pretty large expense with that. Um, we, we came um, into the budget conversation last year estimating $120,000 annually through the next five years. So uh, that kicked off. Um, in 2023, and we hope to see that continue. And then um, the only thing that we don't have implemented right now is um, kickstarting some of the community programs that, that we'd like to start rolling out. Um, long term, we'd like to see those funded through uh, fines um, accumulated through the development review, uh, which is uh, what our code recommendations are assisting with. Um, but we do anticipate a smaller startup cost to get those going. There are other funding uh, and resources available um, outside of the city budget. So already we apply for small grants to the Colorado Tree Coalition annually. Um, right now we use those for EAB injections. Um, they're small, they're $4,000, but uh, we've been able to get those. Last year we, we secured $4,000 and we did a um, free tree giveaway um, around the Powers Park neighborhood. 
2023, um, there has been some significant grant funding that's come down through the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, specifically geared to, towards urban forestry. Um, Mary has put together two really great proposals um, for that, uh, 150000 really geared to social equity programs, um, which would really, uh, first and foremost, would be a community survey to understand the needs and desires of our community. Um, it would help to employ some community tree stewards um, to really help take the workload off of us and touch more of the community um, and assist in their needs. And then uh, a tree fund for under-resourced communities to receive uh, or to increase canopy equity. Um, the second is $300,000 uh, that we'll be going after for uh, tree health care in conjunction with that social equity index map. Um, Mary's proposed these to the grant administrator already. They, she's received really promising feedback. Um, so we are we are very hopeful that we will be receiving that funding in, for 2024. I just want to, want to point out that that photo on the right shows that our staff truly are outstanding in their field. <laughs> that was on, um, that was on. I, I, I did it. Oh my it. gosh. <laughs> 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 yeah, we might not have a lot of acreage, but we know where to stand. Continue. So, so there's a lot here. I won't read through it, but um, I just wanted to point out that there's been a a ton of public outreach and engagement to this point already, and there's going to be a lot more needed to achieve our goals. Um, and so Mary already got out there last year with all the meet greet needs to do some tabling, to do some EAB education and just general education um, about what the city does. This year, we're really going to be focusing on build, building trust with the community. Um, so as we start rolling out these programs, they actually like, believe us because one of the big hurdles in trying to give away free trees last year, people were like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, What's the catch? Right. Did you like, say I'm with really the government? Really just want to give you a tree. <laughs> so I was, like, I was like, I work for the city of Littleton, and they were like, and? I was like, all right, yeah, we've got some work. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so, yeah, so this year we'll really be focused on that and then just increasing our presence in the community. So we don't um, – we need to build our presence on the website and social media. Um, and then as we move into 2024 and we start building on those community programs, um, we hopefully get those uh, tree stewards. Um, <coughs> our, our efforts will go a lot further because people know us and they trust us. And, um, yeah, so that is our last slide. <laughs> Any questions, Council? Thank you. Is there any more dad jokes? Point, which no, 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 no more dad jokes, just questions. Urban discussions. Um, like yeah. It feels like the master planning process is kind of coming yeah, so on. Well, and is there? To go to, to Council Bar, ask about our leverage position with mm -hmm. South Suburban. So um, one of the things that we've been targeting with South Suburban and we're in the midst of now is as we go through our own open space master plan over this 12 months, one of our goals is to really establish what Littleton wants. And then how is that reflected in an update to the operating agreement? The agreement hasn't been up to, updated since the early 80s. Um, so it's really an opportunity for us to define levels of service and our expectations and how are we going to partner with them to be successful over time. So to me, that's the spot we're going to be doing that. And I, I can assure you, Pam and Kelly will um, talk about that with um, their board members as well on a regular basis. So, and, you know, with that, I would just, I just want to wrap with saying that, you know, like council's talked about some really important other issues that are important, and that's the growth of your environmental stewardship goals, your um, diversity and equity, and social context goals, and this is a program that really supports that, um, and it also shows us an opportunity how we can actually measure our impact on that equity side with things like infrastructure and trees. So we're going to be taking some of that and migrating it over some of our other service areas so we can see some of that as how our work impacts different parts of the community and we have a measurable impact over time. So those are things that this supports your bigger goals as a community and we'll continue to focus on those. Okay. Just have one comment, don't need to necessarily respond, but as we move forward with the, the forestry master plan, you know, as you said, residential is clearly the, the biggest impact of the trees. Um, figure out a way to get people 
understanding what trees they have and also incentives to because a lot of the, the dead trees that need help are on private property and we need to figure out how to, to, to improve on those. I'll say that is what our a huge hope of what our um, code updates will be. So establishing the tree manual will put a price on if trees are getting removed in the development pro process. Right now we just have remove a tree, replace a tree, and that doesn't quantify, you know, those two. Even don't. the cost with Exactly, so putting a cost per diameter like, inch is the plan. And then the hope is if that can all go, my dream would be for that to go into a tree fund that then can go on to like a private property focus. Um, it's not super common to see cities doing it, but there are a few in the front range that are. And so then it's an application process. So you say, I have a tree that needs to be pruned or treated or removed or planted or, you know, whatever it is. And then you can apply. Well, it's a benefit to the property owner. It's also a benefit to the community. Right, exactly. It's, yeah. it's, it's helping. Helping them and it helps us. Yeah, I mean, it's like our own toolbox. We want to be able to have that part of that community trust is having a toolbox that private owners can look to to help enhance those situations that they have. Like, Green trees is not cheap. <coughs> Very expensive. Especially if you have Davies tree plant, two of them. <laughs> you could have done it, Jerry. You could be out there with a shovel. They said these cottonwoods will grow fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for this. Right, well, thank you for the... Uh, <laughs> one question, one question. I'm sorry. Yeah. So what is the prognosis on that tree at Pitcher? Oh, I so, so. <laughs> Can I, I take that? Can I speak openly to that? Okay, so. <laughs> we put the lights on it. That's all we want. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, so we recently kicked off the Kettering Gallup master plan. And uh, as part of that, we, we identified removing that fence. It's really a quick win of that program. Um, so it was assessed by an arborist. Um, we asked. Make sure we all defer to Keith. I don't want to say something I'm not supposed to say. We, I think that um, we've taken a very much more technical approach to tree assessment than our partners at South Suburban. And so um, we believe that based on the information that we have um, from our a technical assessment that we believe we can remove that fence um, and make that more of an active part of the community. Obviously some signage and things, but at the end of the day. So we, we're working on that with South Suburban as part of our ongoing efforts to align goals and align the way we look at trees in our in our parks. So that's just part of the process right so now. So safety issues kind of gone away then? The, the trees, you know, it, it's a big old tree. It could fall down, it could not fall down. And you, you, as long as it's structurally okay, you know, it should be fine. Just, that's I wouldn't really encourage you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to fall down. I, I wouldn't encourage not, neighbors. It depends on what the size of the other day. Just kind of. You know, I would, we would love to see that venture. <laughs> Why did they put it Technical in description. description. It's a good yeah. <laughs> I, I think Kelsey's face is saying it's time for this uh, <laughs> to end, so. The, the complication, the tree has been cabled. That's the, that's the complication, was they went in and they did cabling um, to make it more structurally sound. Uh, it was done wrong, so they made it a little more dangerous, so then they redid the cabling which improved the structural integrity, but the fence remained. And so we're at a pivot point of, okay, all trees have some degree of risk. Does this have any it's more risk? We all do. <laughs> it might fall over, might stand up, who knows? <laughs> so, so the fence is potentially going to go away and the tree will remain? Okay. The tree's not going anywhere yet. So at a minimum, we're looking to get a more aesthetically pleasing fence in there. So... so. Just don't bring your kids over there. Or green fencing around. Or grandchildren. Thank you all. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Thank you. We should have this comedy show more regularly. <laughs> I haven't even started my tree puns. <laughs> we know what these meetings are like. Huh? We know what it's God. like to say. Hi. Really? Let's go. Oh, my God. 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 Oh, my God.
213 and how potentially we could be uh, more proactive moving forward with some of our land use choices. So Jennifer yep. makes such a graceful entrance into the room here. <laughs> Someone's <laughs> locked out over there. Actually, that was that was Keith's cue to like wrap it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> he, did, he did not pick up on it. <laughs> so we're fresh on the heels of uh, SB two two thirteen, and uh, I know we all had our own kind of nuanced angles on why it was, you know, bad for Littleton. Some thought it was good for Littleton. Uh, but I think one thing we all didn't care for was this, the preemption of local authority and mandates. Uh, I have heard some interest. I think we've, we've heard that that's, there's some support for moving forward um, with some of the provisions of SB 213. So with the memory fresh of the actual bill, we wanted to have a study session and um, just kind of recap the key provisions um, so that council kind of has what, what those are. We want to place them in the context, though, of the ongoing code updates, ULUC updates that we have going now, because those are, are well underway. Um, and so we want to kind of talk about those, make sure that we, that we all know which what, the, what, the, what those are. And then if there's council interest, we can talk about how we can move forward with some additional code updates <coughs> that would more fully update uh, pursuant to some of the SB 213 provisions. So, and, um, and what impacts, if any, they would have on, on other work. Right. And so, yeah, I think we also want to comment, just give a little, little more uh, feel for council to what's involved with that kind of project. So, you know, all council always thinks, like, we tell you to do it, but it should be done, do it. Like, there's nothing else you're doing, just, just do it. Right. So, that's, how, that's how it works, right? <laughs> so I'll turn over to Kathleen. Let's you let your cue to refute that statement. <laughs> I do feel like with SB 213, I feel like I should say, I'm back. Um, even though the legislation, um, you'll kind of remember the timeline, you know, with the first introduction of the interest of the governor and the state of the state address. Um, to consider some measures around housing, waiting, 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 um, dropped right towards the end of the legislative session. Um, a lot more time <coughs> probably spent on those briefing papers and summaries than maybe on the actual legislation. Um, but what we did find useful is to kind of that last iteration, we tried to do a matrix for you as part of your packet so we could kind of take a look at those key policy provisions and just kind of understand what those may look like in the context of our work on both creating, you know, the entire body of Envision. So from the vision comprehensive plan to the unified land use code, really kind of look at that um, juxtaposed against these policy areas. So if you will remember, and, and the matrix kind of is outlined, uh, accessory dwelling units are part of those key policy areas transit-oriented communities. These are really around fixed transit areas. So think of that half mile circle around our light rail stations. Key corridors, which are really more in reference of frequent bus service. That could be bus rapid transit or, or bus service that's 15 minutes or greater. Unfortunately, we don't have any corridors that qualify um, with our level of service that's provided by RTD currently. And, um, looked at occupancy limits, the sale of public assets, manufactured homes, and then this idea of ongoing housing study and blending those into the state legislation referred to master plans. I think that's sort of synonymous with comprehensive plan um, and more the parlance that, that we would use out, at a municipal level. So see, they don't even know what to call the plan. Now, are we going to be considered a key corridor, even though there's not bus rapid transit, it's a heavily isn't it? So Service the key corridors is directly related to that 15 minute frequency of okay. transit service or greater. Okay. So, a, you know, if it's, it's either 15 minutes or more frequent than that, the only 15 minute service that remains right now, according to, you know, when you look at all of the routes that we've had, even from the transportation master plan to today, the only 15 minute service left we have is light rail. Gotcha. Occasionally. Occasionally. 
That's a different have the sea line anymore. That is a different presentation, and I know it's been an evening. So we'll keep, we'll keep going on, on that front. Um, the only overlap that we see kind of with some of the current uh, adjustments that we're looking at for the Unified Land Use Code is on accessory dwelling units. So we'll spend a little time towards the end of this presentation. Um, but, you know, the... Um, what the state legislation was really looking at is making the accessory dwelling units allowed in all residential zones, no off-street parking requirement, and then really kind of govern sort of that size. What we're looking at is removing that conditional use permit and making it easier to construct or convert spaces. Um, so clearing that path, and, and we'll kind of spend some time with Jen just talking through um, both that as well as the other um, Five, the other four areas that we're looking at for ULUC adjustments. Um, Transit-oriented communities, again, more of that fixed transit <coughs> service. So really looking at multifamily use by right within a half mile circle of those stations, um, allowing for more of uh, mixed use, first floor retail, mixed income, uh, 60 units per acre. So really reflecting on densities, uh, off street parking that is probably one of the the bigger distinctions between where we are with um, our transit oriented communities we do have sort of parking relief as part of that um, being close to a transit station um, but there is still a parking requirement as part of that and then um, you know there is a provision within how the state legislation was written to still kind of keep inclusionary housing or ordinances as part of that mix the key corridors, again, we don't have any qualifying service, but if we did, really applies to those, those roadways served by 15-minute transit service, um, mixed income, multifamily, use by right, uh, reflects on density levels, and then maximum parking, um, where we have generally looked more at a, a minimum parking requirement. So... That takes us to, that flies us through kind of those policy areas for Senate Bill 213. We have that one area of overlap. I think what is important for, for council to remember is that as part of these provisions through Senate Bill 213, it essentially would create a statewide model code. And as you maybe got a chance to look through that matrix, in many cases, we're doing you know, at least or a little bit better than some of those provisions. There are some opportunities to kind of look at those policies. That model code would have gone into effect um, three years from now, the end of 2026. So I do think that we're on a path to address <coughs> some of these policy areas. Um, we have a pretty elaborate spreadsheet, you know, Jen will kind of reference that a little bit of where we see these policy opportunities, where we see that timing, and how we're going through a process to kind of understand what those priorities look like, um, and really trying to be very cognizant of, you know, everything from what we're receiving from planner on the planner on call or planner of the day um, to other inputs to understand where that mix and where that priority really needs to to rise for um, future updates. So I'll let Jen talk a little bit about these five and just kind of remind you of what we're really working towards with these updates to the universe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of talk about the key points in these, these topic areas that we have focused ourselves on and the why of why we focused on these. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail <coughs> as we, we can do moving forward. So in terms of the ADUs, um, we knew that housing is a top goal for council. And we did take the approach, if you remember, in our first iteration of the code, not the changes, but the actual code when we adopted it, we did that slight dip of our toe into ADUs and allowing them in certain sections of the city, and we wanted to see how that went. What we're finding um, on that, um, we have actually gotten five applications for ADUs. Um, of that, uh, three have been issued. One was for detached. The other ones were for contained. <coughs> and cost-wise, we're seeing anywhere from $100,000 to $350,000 for an ADU. And obviously, that depends on size. 
So what we decided on this, this next go around was how can we make that process easier? Would that help us get more ADUs? So two of the things that we identified were removing the possibility of there being a conditional use permit, um, and that's really for that detached um, accessory dwelling unit, and then also just making the process um, clearer um, and easier. So this touches on improving our process, um, we also are looking at increasing our size for a detached unit. We had a relatively low number that was more in that tiny home level. Um, we're increasing it. That was also one of the recommendations coming out of SB 213 was to increase the size of accessory dwelling units. So that is something that we're doing now. The allowable size, not the minimum. Um, cor correct, the, the allowable size. Um, we have put a max on it, so increasing that max. Um, so those are the, that's what the ADU topic of the ULUC updates is focused on, is really clearing that process, trying to make it easier, and increasing size. So that's what it's focused on. Um, in terms of the adaptive can, reuse... Can I ask a real quick question? Yeah. Just keeping it in the same area or opening up citywide? Let's, right now, keeping it in the same area. Let's let her get through all these, okay. and then we can leave this up here and go back mm -hmm. through and discuss it one by one. Okay. Um, so the next one on here is adaptive um, reuse. Uh, we have had several applications of trying to use this process, and it was very confusing both on the administrative side um, as well as for the applicant. So really the focus on here is it's an unclear process. How do we make it clearer? We're simplifying or we're making an administrative review. It was unclear if it was administrative or if it would go through a building permit process or it would go through a site plan process. So really making it an administrative review on that. Um, this touches on council goals of sustainability and resiliency, and it's really help in terms of economics and helping our businesses be able to better reutilize existing buildings. Um, so. That touches, um, by changing that, that touches on three sections of our code. So you're going to see changes on three sections there. On cottage court communities, we needed to clarify the density, size, uh, structure, and size of lot and parking requirements on that. So we have had some couple applications that we believe do not meet the intent um, necessarily of cottage court communities. So uh, really looking at our requirements to make the intent more clear through regulation. So that is the purpose of on the cottage court communities. And that's middle housing, which Correct. is a, a big goal. Correct. So, okay. Can you clarify how you mean so the applications didn't meet the intent? Are you talking about size, <coughs> density, layout? Like what was the unintended component of that. Right. So if you look at um, what's online in terms of the example of a cottage court, <coughs> it shows a two-acre site with 24 units. Mm -hmm. What we've received, um, and those units are smaller, um, but then when you look at our density requirements, it didn't meet that image. It's too high or too low? Too, too low. Way, way too low. In other words, you wanted to increase it. Yeah. Correct. Why? Correct. Um, going back to the intent of having another um, entry point for home ownership or size of housing, um, different price point, it meets all those requirements. Um, where one of the applications that we received met the Okay, I, the open space requirement didn't meet the parking requirement. The size was in the 3,000 to 5,000 square foot home range. And that's when we realized, okay, we probably, if our intent okay. is this different entry level point, it wasn't, yeah. we, need, we need to have more parameters on it of minimum lot size. What was the cost per unit and what were you hoping to get it down? <sighs> 
you know, that is what it was high and they're hoping to get a lower. <laughs> exactly. Do I have a specific <laughs> number? Uh, no. When you think it's of a 3,000, 5,000 square foot it's home, not affordable. new construction yeah. in no, the town. No, it's not. Right. Ridge. Is that one of them? <laughs> <laughs> Where were you? It, that's expensive. Oh, yeah. 3,000 uh, to 5,000 square feet mm -hmm. of new, new construction. <laughs> <laughs> the, these are intended to be. So you're, you're, it's something less than 5,000 square feet. Yes, I mean, I mean, that's some of the that's square fine. footage we're looking at is, is actually less than 1,200. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, um, so that's the cottage court clarifications, and um, and then the temporary signs. I don't even feel like I need to <laughs> explain the temporary. I mean, this is really just we don't want to have to be issuing permits for temporary signs, so it just needed to be clarified in the code. Yes, so we're. Adding a definition for not state germane science. to two thirteen, we can move on. Yes. So, um, <laughs> and then on the major and minor plan amendments, it's again focused on simplification and clarification. We had both a major plan amendment and a minor plan amendment, and we're really making it: if you don't fall under a major, then you do another process. So again, that that clarification. And then on the master development plan criteria, if you'll remember last year, we, we looked at master development plan and we did <coughs> it. And again, this is our living document. So we're learning from everything going through. So here we are again in another year. And really that, uh, an additional clarification and process. Um, and we're adding a natural resources criteria. And that really helps to answer the question of quality of design. That was something that Planning Commission was was having some challenges with what does quality of design mean? So we're adding a natural resources category. And I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, even just talking about one of these, touching multiple parts Correct. of the code, um, you might think, oh, this seems like an easy list. This doesn't take much that. time to put together. <laughs> um, but, you know, all of the, the modifications that we're looking at now are about 18 months in the making. Correct. And so it is It is a very elaborate <clears throat> process. Not everyone is cut out for it. I'll be the first to read my hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but you know, it's, it's, you pull one thread, right? And you can disrupt the fabric very, very easily. So there's a lot of complexity to it. And, and I think if, if Jen can just reflect a little bit on you know, we're, um, what we're trying to blend together in terms of the demands on our planning staff, this is a, one of the, the big priorities that, that her staff is trying to tackle Correct. along with process improvement, process improvement, which has a lot of overlap with our development review process. Correct. Um, also, you know, these projects. Right. I mean, we, you know what the pipeline looks like as we were talking about things like the inclusionary housing ordinance. These are large, complicated projects that require a lot of dedication. Um, and then, you know, just little things like the phone or email when people have questions about things that are going on, keeping the development activity list up to date. So there are a lot, there are a lot of other demands as well. And, um, I think we, we want to make sure that as we think through um, going back to some of those policy areas for Senate Bill 213, that we have an opportunity to really understand if you do pull a little bit on that thread, what what is that sort of ripple or planning commission's discussion last night, that domino effect. Um, so that does require a lot of analysis and, and why even these code updates are about 18 months in the making. These... Um I think one one very clear example that would need some philosophical discussion is how the how some changes to two thirteen ish might affect the the uh, the, uh, the IHO that you know that we have some incentives based in there to drive affordability. Um, two thirteen didn't really address affordability directly. Uh, many of the changes that we could make from two thirteen. Um, would affect the incentive balance that we have um, and would may have an effect on our ability to, um, you know, drive affordability through projects coming. So 
I think there are, are ways that we can mitigate that, but we don't want, want to be hasty with it and we, we don't want to really think through how we address affordability as we move forward. And, and as council will remember that inclusionary housing ordinance, we really designed that to be in partnership and not be disruptive to projects in the pipeline. We know that, that housing is a key priority, that we have housing needs. And so we really picked that percentage and that commitment from the private sector very intentionally to try and disrupt the pro forma of projects least. Um, so that we know that there is still housing supply that's going to come forward, um, but then also looking at those process incentives to, to try and ease that path um, for projects. So I think when we look at things like <coughs> parking, we really want to understand, you know, if all projects were treated the same across the board for part, uh, parking, then what does that mean for that parking relief that is offered as part of the inclusionary housing ordinance? So there's just a level of analysis that um, we would lean kind of on that that technical expertise that Jen and her staff so, so expertly have. So I think we've done this, but I my my uh, priority and the, the kind of direction to our our planning staff and the development service is that we is that we have to keep those big projects and the, the key projects at downtown moving. Uh, we have to be ready and have the uh, capacity to move those those forward when they, if they're not already in, when they do come in. And then we have a, a number of, you know, of, of important things happening um, that, are, that are already in the works. So um, all this to say, and I know that, that it, it is late. Tonight, we'd like to hear your direction. If you have specifics from 213 that you'd like us to plan to address. Um, we think it's worth, given this list, we'd like to move forward with the code update process that we have in the works already. We'd like to, you know, we have more public comment, public public engagement happening, you know, through the, the summer. Our, we're currently planned to, you know, be through that process, including planning commission and council um, by the 1st of October, generally. Um, we'd like to be able to put these things in place, per, if that's that's council's wish. Um, and then I think it would work best for all that's that's going on if, if we could bring you, if, if we could take your direction tonight and then come back with a timeline, proposed timeline um, for the next round of code updates, which would implement <coughs> council's direction on these on additional housing items that could be you know those those two thirteen type things, um, so we have more examples if council would like to hear tonight. It's a, we want to make sure that we're on the same page about priorities and the time that it, it does take to do code updates well. Um, but at this point <coughs> where, where we are, we can pause, take some questions. But our our recommendation again is to move forward in the process that we have and then, you know, come back with a timeline proposed to uh, make the next round of, of housing related code updates. And that gets back to your comment, <coughs> we'll go back to the top of the seat with EDUs. Um, you know, my my personal thought is to be more, much more permissive with EDUs, like 213 said. You know, I mentioned that to, to, to Jim and Jennifer. And I think the the response was more like, yeah, we can do that, but then that takes away from staff's capacity mm -hmm. to manage other things, historic preservation, dealing with applications and permits that are, aren't related to necessarily even just housing, but anything else. So that's kind of where this idea of what, how, how far can we push staff that they can still reasonably do their job, or at least push the policy, not push staff, push the policy <laughs> so staff can, can do it. We can, you know, we'll have some, <clears throat> some options for some uh, contract <laughs> help, for help for this, and we can move things along, you know, as expeditiously as we can. But as Kathleen was suggesting, this will, we'll, we'll need months to do this well, to make sure that when you pull that, that thread that it doesn't bring the whole thing apart and that we have time for public for the public in, in, uh, in engagement process, as we know, especially with ADUs and some other things, that that's going to be important. Um, we want to do it well and you know, deliver. And I think we'll still be ahead of most other communities. And that timeline that was anticipated with 213 
Um, I think 213 did, you know, um, give time, and it was going to be a couple years to put things in place, and we think we can we can beat that, but it is going to take some time. And like with the ADUs is, you know, how much is the return on the investment? I, you know, in my mind, and probably in your mind, is low-hanging fruit, something easy to do, but does that really give us the housing that, you know, you know five units, even if we extend it to the whole city, you know, the fear that people have that it's going to change the neighborhood, it's not going to do a whole lot. There's going to have a handful of them throughout the entire city. So is it worth diverting resources to do that? I mean, you know, I would, I would like to do it, but is it really worth the diverting the resources that it is? I agree. I, I mean, I, you know, of course, I want to push it as far as you can take it, as far as it'll go and, and what you can do. Because if you look at it, really five applications, that's it. Since we updated the code, I mean, that's not a lot. And they, it does cost a lot of money, but... Instead of being restrictive about it, you know, of course, I would like to open it up to to anybody because um, it does generate more housing and it can potentially generate income for whoever owns that house. But I don't want to I don't want to unravel. Well, and, and, and I think, you know, that that's something that there's interest from Planning Commission as well mm -hmm. on that front. So I think it's just making sure that when you make that change, it's eyes wide open. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. So so it is that there is a level of analysis and understanding what how that is connected to other parts of the code and making sure that it stays in line with our overall housing strategy. Right. Because it has not been the case for other communities that DDUs have solved affordability right. and as much going to. as much as as much as they have hoped and set policies right. in place and even made funding streams available for that it really hasn't been a tool to address affordability yet but it can be a component of a greater housing strategy so i i think if that if that's something that is of interest we just we're just asking for the time. The well, use aren't going to be like for, for sale. They're, those are going to be rental properties. Mm -hmm. So I, that's so I think we one need to be the levers that you have to look at. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we got to be realistic and, that you know. That's sort of and housing fine. rents is part of the, the, the that's a equation, equation there. Yeah, we're we're rental still about a, a 50 50 almost a fifty fifty in terms of rental versus ownership mm -hmm. in the city. So. I think that is, you know, it's a form of, of housing that feeds the sure. overall strategy. Yeah. So the idea with having this conversation is, you know, while two thirteen is still fresh in our brains, it's gonna it'll be back in probably seven months. Um, yes, it will. In a in a different form of how we can get ahead of some of the things that they may or may not uh, produce, uh, you know, uh, uh, recommend. You know, I've asked staff to work with the governor's office to figure out, you know, so one to show them, hey, this is why this process works the way it does, or why that doesn't work, things like that. Um, is there anything world state is city. in this list that uh, you council is not seeing that they would really, really like to see, given the bigger picture of you know the capacity of staff and with what do we do for a, a, a larger overhaul of the OUC in two years? Was it twenty twenty five? Well, I mean, another consideration is we're coming up to that five year mark of the comprehensive plan and we okay. made that promise to our community that we would update that document every five years that's coming up very soon so you know part of the recommendations could then be part of the content of the comp plan to feed a larger overhaul can we just approve that two will. years ago i'm sorry 2019. 2019 we approved it 2019 2019 oh. october of 2019 <laughs> okay. I remember yeah, it well. You forget about the missing um, three years there. I do. I do think that um, it was BC before COVID. You know, when we <laughs> when we went through that process, where we found a lot of success was was having that values based conversation with the community. Um, so I think that that does allow you to have a more holistic conversation. So there may be there may be certain regulatory. Um, adjustments that we could make right through the ULUC or, mm -hmm. or through other provisions um, that might make sense in the short term but I think that value based <coughs> and larger more holistic conversation allows you to think about these as tools right so if the value of the community is housing and more diverse types of housing like we heard in the last comprehensive plan then what are what are some of the tools that you can empower to deliver that That's my values. I guess I I would like to focus on defining some of the stuff. You said that you're, you struggle with some of the developers coming in and the planning commission is struggling with some of that stuff. That's the things that we need to address now. Because as, as you said, we're going to 
revising anyway here in a couple of years. I think it needs to be cleaned up where it is now, which is what we expected, mm -hmm. you know, so because it's, it's a living document. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I can see <coughs> get, uh, cleaning it up as far as definitions on what it is supposed to say. So it's more yeah. clear for everybody. And I think, you know, like staffs identified rows and rows and rows in a spreadsheet of things that, you know, yes, things that like make sense, true. right? And yeah. then there's that, how how they get prioritized is where we feel those biggest pinch points, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. so these things are really coming to you because they are current pinch points. Right. Well, your bucket is only so big, so you can only take on the, the definitions of whatever, knowing that in two years you're going to, man, your bucket's going to get huge. But I think a couple of things you see on this list, like the master development plan criteria, major and minor plan amendments, those are important um, for our the, the fundamental kind of ULUC, um, you know, how it's working. And I think if those things, if, if we can fix them or clarify them now, it will set us up for the next comprehensive mm -hmm. plan, the next the next round of the overall update a little bit better. So Otherwise, you're, you're going to be clarifying and updating at the same time. Right. Right. So is there any ever a time, because we're talking about 2.13 and it's getting close to 10 o'clock, that we can talk about some of the old updates? I mean, I had some questions about things that were kind of rolling around that were are probably on your spreadsheet, but maybe it's not appropriate for this conversation, but can we have it another time? Is it an offline conversation could, to find out what, like, what's been in my own conservation districts? Conceptual versus uh, what, you know, our cottage communities on the edge, I have some questions. Signs, signs were the bane of my existence there for a while. Um, those are you know, the bane of your existence <laughs> is mostly those. going to be addressed. Yeah. Well, the I mean, but like for example, the size of temporary them. signs that was that's yeah, that's, that's in, there. in there. Okay, I, to me, I I didn't see it. Yeah, and I can I take this opportunity to re remind council that we have a, a platform to receive comments, and we really encourage you all to use that platform so we can get your comments in there so as well. So you want to put my comments in there? It doesn't yeah, hurt. It is, and it is not visible. It is only visible to staff. It is not visible to, to the that public. That would be the most efficient way for yes. you to get your specific comments on the ULUC updates to staff. June 5th? I, for our first round of, of comment period, it's, it is June 5th. Okay. And if you need help with that, just call one of our planners and, and they can walk you through that. So but I appreciate you clarifying the density size of the cottage courts because that is a big piece of the mis missing middle, right? right? So thank you for doing and that. For the record, I will. I'll, I do want to note that I, I did have an email from uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ryden with um, a couple um, requests for you know what she thinks is, is important. Um, to come, you know, as we move into the, the next round. So I won't take a little time right now to read them, but um, we'll incorporate those as we come back to council with potential updates and what this next round could involve. Well, <clears throat> I have to go to the code and she gets, how, how can I do what she well, She was basically, <laughs> she's not, she's not, she's not talking about, talking about She these. was talking about this agenda item here tonight. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not so to, she not was to saying well. was, which things was, from 213, the, the, some okay. of the specifics that she would like to see us. I mean, I'd much rather do a memo than sit in there and try to figure that out. <laughs> you can send us a memo too. Okay. I'm, I'm fine with that too. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure that council understands that 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 is the best place for us to hear your specific comments. But if you want to write a memo, I'm fine with that as well. I just, that guarantees it gets in there. <laughs> so, um, Any other questions, comments about specifically to 213 policy as it relates to ULUC so updates? So what are we suggesting to staff based on capacity issues and they're suggesting that this is what they're working on. Okay, so that was the 213. So this is, the this is actually work. this is the 213 summary. That's so oh. <clears throat> our current that are out for public comment right now. I wish this would go faster. Are these ULUC updates? And again, you know, our best practice is that we provide them. Hit pause. 
take that feedback, incorporate some of that, and reintroduce those those edits. So it's roughly two six month or six months six week comment periods, four to Correct. six weeks. Um, so that is also a component that we feel like is super important. Um, something that we established all along the way, if you remember, even with the first step of the unifying vision of putting it out there, getting the feedback, making the changes, and putting out another draft. So, so do, we like, yeah. do we like the sweater that they provided us, or do we want to pull on a thread and tell them to change something about the sweater, and who knows what else it will unravel for them? I'm okay with this. Okay. No, I'm good. Okay. I'm good with you proceeding forward, Jim, but also like we trust you to be that honest barometer of the staff capacity. So when there is time and space available to start tackling some of these other challenges, yeah. please do let us know so we can start team that. That's up. what Mike's for, right? So you're saying you don't want them to have the staff sit around? Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is for sure. And, and I do you think that there's an opportunity to to, to <laughs> talk <laughs> knowing that Sorry. this legislation in particular particular was really about addressing housing and housing supply. I think there's an opportunity for us to, to come back with, you know, some additional thoughts and direction. Um, now working with Julie Latham, our housing policy analyst. So we're in the process of getting that on your tentative calendar in the fall. So that might be an opportunity to do that. We're, we're trying to couple that together with an update from and joint meeting with the South Metro Housing Options Board. Um, so I, I think that we can come back at that point too and just kind of tell you the the horizon of, of what we're seeing yeah and then and we're also are, working on some suitability models and in, in yeah. gis um you know we will definitely bring back to you a very robust slate of hey these are the different things that we think will move the needle more um but we just i'd like to have the time for our staff to be able to focus on that and bring you the data, the visual tools that are going to make that story easier to tell. Thank you. Thank you. Before I get to the city manager, I just had one quick one feedback from council. I don't know if you remember last year, how many months ago, we had a resolution to support the Helper Act in Congress. It was a bipartisan resolution about. Um, housing for police and firefighters and I was opposed to that, yes. yeah, we're opposed to that. <laughs> um, it had didn't pass the uh, Congress I guess it's being reintroduced I, the same uh, legislative affairs person reached out to me asking if council is interested would be willing to do that resolution again I just want to see this council support just having that resolution yeah. sure tell us more just like What's the resolution that we support? So the Helper Act is a bipartisan federal bill which would aid uh, firefighters, EMTs, and teachers into how it's like a VA style home loan program to get uh, those people um, purchase homes. So it was just saying we support the resolution. It would help with our housing. It's, we don't it doesn't we don't have to put any investment into it. Just saying, Congress, this helps pass it. So let's wait till we see the legislation before we make a decision. I think they already have the legislation. It's oh, just a, a copy of it. Look at it. Okay. Well, that can be part. I'm so, hearing that there's inter <coughs> interest to have a resolution, put the the, uh, the the legislation with Not that resolution. Me, no. Okay. Well, majority yeah. council, so get your direction there. Thank you. So, update from city manager. Yeah, I have a similar thing. Um, heard some interest from a couple, a couple of council members um, about having a, a conversation, uh, exploring the concept of a safe parking <coughs> facility, uh, um, kind of piloting one. Um, these are uh, uh, the mayor and mayor per, mayor okay, per, per yeah. ride. Um, so per your rules, we bring that to the group. If there's interest, we would bring that back for more conversation. What it, what th those are essentially are they are uh, facilities, a parking lot that is associated with a facility in town. Commonly, as these are being um, implemented, churches um, could volunteer some parking lot space. Um, for unhoused individuals who are living out, out living out of their cars, um, to come and sleep, you know, in these uh, parking lots and their in their vehicles. Typically, these arrangements have kind of three partners. There might be a city who's kind of trying to broker some of these these spaces. Um, there might be there would uh, likely be a zoning code. Um, change for us to to allow this this use 
Um, there would be a nonprofit partner who actually operates the space. So there typically are uh, porta potty restroom facilities. There's some monitoring of the space. Um, so there would be a partner for that required. And then of course the uh, property owner, which might be a church. Um, so these are, you know, being experimented with across the uh, metro area. Um, finding a safe parking we, pilot we, facility we is can get already... into that in more detail in future discussion. Okay. If council has interest in having that discussion. Fair enough. So um, that's really the reason, just to see if you're interested in hearing more about it and learning what we'd ha have to do to to have one. I'm, I'm not interested. We can't even get our panhandling thing done. And here we are want to take something on huge. I understand that part of the thing, but we can't even address panhandling. We're still taking the thing. I'm interested in hearing more about it. Thank you. Yeah. What we're doing is gonna get information. Information about it. We're gonna have a study session. Yeah. Maybe we'll talk to get about more the staff and how, how much work they have on their plate. This is just another thing we're adding to their plate. And it's a big one. Yep. It's a huge one. I think if we're interested in sanitation, hygiene, solid waste management, this is a good way to tackle it. Yeah. Yep. So. Okay. Uh, uh, I do have a happy thing. Um, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> he was in the back there, but uh, he shared with, with me today that um, today the group, of, if, if council will, will recall, the group of students from McIntosh Academy who was, was here to, to tell us about stormwater and keeping storm, rain, storm water oh, from right, getting into the right, river. Right. Um, they actually had completed their project today of marking 18 locations for reminding folks to, um, you know, keep stuff out, keep bad stuff out of the drains. Yay! Um, that's so cool. Uh, yeah. Understand that we actually have uh, perhaps an ice cream thank you coming their way. So <laughs> that's cool. Great. That's um, great. That's awesome. Yeah. So thanks to the staff. I want, I want to say that awesome. helped that's make great. that work and to the uh, students and the and nice the community department. Okay, that's Thanks. all I have, Mayor. City Attorney, still with us. <laughs> no report today. <laughs> all right, with that, we are adjourned.